Alrighty then. So, as you can see, um, some churches have been uh, invaded um, in ways by Israelites. These are more of the overt ways, in, in particular, African American churches are have been challenged. Um, you saw from a Baptist church to a Pentecostal church or Apostolic church. It was one of the two because they was speaking in public tongues, <clears throat> um, and so you see that that has become a major challenge. Uh, to churches of people bold enough to go within into churches and or either stand outside of churches and protest and different things like that. And we'll see that those are the more stereotypical overt groups and we'll find out and learn tonight about some groups that aren't as overt but are a lot more covert, all right? Um, first thing I want us to look at, um, this one's already in there, so you, I'm, I'm gonna let you read it. Uh, read for me First Peter 3, 15, please. Amen. And so defense, somebody say defense. defense. The Greek word for defense is apologia. Somebody say apologia. Apologia, apologia means defense, a legal defense. And so it's the speech, uh, uh, the, the speech act of attempting to prove, to prove um, some act or belief to be reasonable, necessary or right, especially occurring uh, in a court of law. And so when you look at this idea of what the scripture says here, which says, but in your hearts, regard Christ uh, as holy and as Lord. And so one of the things that's very, very important with this verse is before you start engaging with people, you have to be in the right place in your own heart. Because a lot of people like to read the last part of the verse where they defend in the faith, but there has to be a heart disposition that precedes the way you defend the faith. Because we're supposed to speak the truth in love. Um, and, 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 you know, it's a, it's a passage I don't have up here right now, but it's 2 Timothy verses 23 through the end of the chapter. And the way it talks about talking to people, you know, sometimes I, I don't want to be nice in the name of Jesus, you know. Sometimes I want to, to, to exit the kingdom in the way I verbalize. Um, but the word of God doesn't allow for us to have that type of disposition. So when we talk about this and we look at this, we look at apologetics. From my perspective, apologetics is the brand of Christianity that engages barriers to the gospel by giving re uh, reasonable answers, or reasonable answers rather, to the Bible, Christ, uh, core doctrines, uh, or, or, or core doctrines of the Bible, use of the Bible, history, particularly primary resources, ancient manuscripts, sociology, culture, to give a viable defense uh, for the above, even science in some cases with the goal of leading people from spiritual death to spiritual life. Say, leading, leading people, people from spiritual death, spiritual death to spiritual, spiritual life. Spiritual Not win the argument. Because there are times when you will look like you lose the argument. But you have to be willing uh, uh, to, to look like you've lost, even though you may be gaining a person in the midst of that conflict. And so when you look at giving a defense for the faith, the, 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 the desire is to make sure that the person gets one, not so that you can look good in front of the people around you listening. Not, not, so, not so that you can go home with your chest puffed out. Because the Bible says knowledge puffs up, but love edifies. And so when we look at the scriptures and we look at the way God works and the way uh, God calls us to, to engage with truth, with love, and what that does, it's very important for us to recognize the beauty of that. So when we talk about this, urban apologetics, though, is a bit different, family. Somebody say urban apologetics. Urban apologetics. Now, urban apologetics is a bit, look at me right, real quick before you look at the slide. Um, urban apologetics is a bit different because general apologetics is just general defense. But uh, urban apologetics is a bit different because we deal with different issues than many people do in other contexts. And so when you look at this, urban apologetics is a brand of general apologetics a branch, rather, by which we take into account the unique experiences, the unique experiences and incarnational realities of African Americans and other minorities in urban environments and how they are engaged to view Christianity as non-indigenous to, to people of color in order to engage them with the gospel and lead them to faith in Jesus. 
When we look at this idea, uh, 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 and we'll, we'll see some of it very, very briefly, and, and we're coming out thriving, we're coming out with a, a Urban Apologetics Masterclass, which is a year-long masterclass that's going to be amazing on video um, that you'll be able to dive into. It's going to be amazing. Uh, videos are being edited and everything at, at, at this point in time now. But here as we talk about this and talk about the unique needs of urban areas, like in general society, you hear them talk about oneness ideology or the Jesus seminar, which are defenses that more scholarly, and I would say, and it's not beating up anybody, but I'm more white brethren, they end up diving into those argumentations. However, African Americans, we tend to deal with a, a bit of a different, and Latinos and uh, different minorities, um, tend to deal with uh, different ideologies because of the, the the impact that dignity development in this country has had on us. And so the dignity development or the lack of dignity development or, or, or really dignity assassination, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, it, 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 it's not merely dignity development, but it's absolute assassination of our dignity. And, and, and so now what had to happen is it's the natural inclination based on Ecclesiastes chapter 3 it talks about God placing eternity in our hearts. There's something bigger than us out there. Most people feel that whole of eternity being in their hearts with other things. But God was meant, based, we were meant based on Acts 17, where Paul says that we should feel our way towards him. His desire was that we feel our way towards him. But the challenge is no one can come to him unless the Father draws him. And so what, but how, well, as we minister, and as we talk to people and engage people, we have to remember that there's a gaping hole in uh, 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 black dignity in this country that in many ways has to be weaved in how we share the gospel. Okay? I had a guy, um, I had a guy um, uh, in, in the, 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 that's a, uh, that um, actually did, uh, does videos, which I'll uh, have his stuff at the end. I'm going to tell you which one it is. But um, he has a friend, the dude just gets on YouTube and just dogs woke church. I know y'all probably saw videos of people just talking crazy about woke church. But this guy ended up hitting me up, and he had been ministering to Hebrew Israelites for like six years. I mean, he's probably the best apologist to Hebrew Israelites because he knows all of their arguments in and out, and he knows all of their responses. And he said to me on the phone the other day, he said, Pastor Mason, I just want to tell you, I realize how important woke church is. He said, because I've been ministering to Hebrew Israelites for all these years and never engaged the dignity issue. And so I've been having the right arguments and I've been engaging them, but the missing component, I think, from my apologetics has been actually affirming their dignity. And I, and I realized after engaging woke church that, that I need to really make sure that I do that and how biblical that is, right? So, what, so what's so unique about black folks' journey in America? Because of white supremacy and the whitewashing and revisionist history, many blacks view Christianity as a myth created by whites as a tool of psychological control over us. And so, we, so when we look at this and we begin to uh, 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 lay the foundation of just the level of psychological control to the point where the Bible Museum has a Bible there, that is an abridged version of the normal Bible in order to keep the passages on liberation out of it in order to psychologically molest black people into believing that their identity is substandard and that, uh, that, that, that being kidnapped and put into the institution of slavery is actually a biblical a way that they should be functioning and living in, which is fully demonic, right? That someone would take away from the word of God in order to keep people from being changed by the word of God. We're not talking about not just, listen to me, we're not talking about you're not just teaching certain things. We're talking about you literally printing a whole new Bible. Yes, yes. You understand what I'm saying? Like, what kind of heart do you have to have to say? But then on the other hand, it's almost inferentially lets you know that Christianity can't be the white man's religion. Because if it was the white man's religion, why would you be scared that we'd read everything and see something about what God has for all people in relation to their freedom, Right? And so questions that many African Americans ask, who am I, my identity, my dignity, and significance. Everybody asks those questions, but black people in America ask those questions on steroids. Everybody asks it. Uh, 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 I remember reading in my psychology class in uh, undergrad, The Search for Significance, great book. But, you, you know, but, but black people, we think about the significance uh, deal deeply, uh, more deeply than many. Who am I? What is my value? 
and what is my purpose? And I would say, and we'll see, the gospel answers all of those questions for all people equally in their spiritual identity and their natural identity. Let me say that again. The Bible, the Bible affirms your dignity in both um, your new identity and your human identity. So where do we go from here? So we look at this, and we look at this crisis in African-American culture. We see that these movements not only called on blacks to reject the classification of themselves as Negro, right, uh, or which uh, uh, leaders taught was a false category created for the purposes of enslavement and subjugation, but offer alternative identities for individual members and black people as a whole. This book, uh, uh, th this book right here actually illuminates that reality. It's a good book. It's a really, really good book. It's up here. I'll, I'll talk about it when we get to resources. To, to, to uh, those new uh, uh, religio-racial ways of understanding the black self and black history and focuses on how members of the religio-racial movement, and when we say religio-racial, what, what she means is, is she's talking about like the Nation of Islam, right? We're even talking about the United House of Prayer, right? Um, that's a religio-racial movement, okay? Of course, Hebrew Israelites on a level and different movements of the type, Nuwapians, um, uh, 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 Moorish Temple of Science, 5% Nation of Islam, all of those different religio-racial movements, even the KKK is a religio-racial movement. <laughs> and so movements enacted the identities they understood to be their reclaimed true ones in daily life. In rejecting re Negro racial identity, leaders and members of these groups do not repudiate blackness or dark skin, but rather endowed it with meaning derived from histories other than those of the enslavement, of enslavement and oppression. So this is the whole significance, dignity, and identity deal where people are, that's why black people don't really trust a lot of information out there. So if you say to a black person, man, your pastor's hiding something from you, they're going to automatically believe you. He hides something from you. It's just a regular person on the street. The pastors, the church, these churches hide stuff because we are socialized to not trust authority. We're socialized not to trust white people. Y'all know I'm telling the truth. Don't act like I'm the only one in here. <laughs> right? And so this socialization has affected us in so many ways. Um, and so where did the history of this movement start? Matter of fact, uh, uh, brother, grab, grab Jude 3 for me real quick. Jude Jude 3, before we go into that, I, I, want us to, I want us to hit up Jude 3 real quick. Uh, we use the NASB, but for Hebrew Israelites, later on I, I have, a, I have a, 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 K, a KJV for those who are my KJV only. Go ahead and hit that up for me, brother. Uh, beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that ye should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. Yeah, contend for the faith. That's what we're called as believers to do. Now, when we begin talking about the Hebrew Israelite movement, I'm going to give history. Um, uh, kind of tonight, I'm going to give history. We're going to go from history to beliefs. We're going to go to, to basically biblical and historical arguments. So this is going to be history, sociology, and Bible heavy. Is that okay? Yeah. All right, all right. So, so here we go. So um, in, in, in this book, um, A Chosen People, uh, a, a, a book that kind of, it doesn't deal with the camps, but it deals with more of the larger historical realities of it. This is the book right here, Chosen People. And um, this is one of the first people to teach that black Americans had Israelite ancestry, had himself lived, in, uh, lived the Exodus narrative in at least four different promised lands. William Sanders Crowdy, that is a very, very, many Hebrew Israelites don't even know this guy, right? Uh, was born into slavery on the southern peninsula of Maryland in 1847. And his first promised land was that of the spirituals and African-American religion during slavery. Talk about Christianity. The, the, the longed-for respite for those who suffered the Egypt of slavery in the antebellum South. So this is, this is William, a, he's, he's, he's known as Prophet Crowdy, right? This is the dude that kind of was the first to experience this, right? Prof, uh, 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 he, he's the founder of the Church of God and the Saints of Christ. So he was born into slavery, experienced liberation, uh, participated in civil war as a teenager, and moved to Kansas City, and then 
to a black town in Oklahoma, I'm wondering, was that uh, Black Wall Street? As a middle-aged man, which was there, as the nation endured a horrific era of lynching and a rise of Jim Crow, uh, that Crowdy had the revelation that African Americans were, in fact, the descendants of the ancient Israelites. He believed that he had a vision and that an angel visited him and that God has showed him that we are the actual ancient Israelites. I, I think most of us were thinking we the ancient Israelites on the hell we was going through in slavery, right? And so when you think about that reality, you'd be like, man, Exodus sure sounds familiar, right? Now, I think you can find principal familiarity, but not practical familiarity. We'll talk about that in a second. Um, one of the guys that's, that's a strand of that is, is, this, is, is, is this brother right here. Uh, uh, um, and he started Israel of God, which is currently in, in Chicago now. Um, that's strange. I, I didn't talk about the Heritage Seekers, but I'll talk about them real quick. Heritage Seekers okay, uh, was a group of the commandment keepers. And, um, and, they, and, and they are actually one, uh, blacks who were part of the 1920s Heritage Keepers movement. I thought I had it up here. And um, they actually, which was called the commandment keepers, and they ended up going into, uh, in the 60s, uh, moving many of them to Israel and have been having a hard time getting nationalized as Israelites because they're not, they haven't converted. They just believe that their bloodline is Israel. And because of that lack of conversion and a lack of ability to prove the DNA evidence that they're actual Israelites, they've had a hard time with it. I think recently the nation has affirmed them, but they're living in hefty poverty. But this dude right here, he's on, he's on YouTube and there's some other OGs to be on YouTube. Uh, there's some funny cats. But but, but, but this Israelite movement, it'll feel like a church. Like this one, the, like when you look at it, you're like, these like Baptist Pentecostal preacher dudes, you know, which many of them were, but just added Hebrew Israelite philosophy to their bandwidth. Are y'all still tracking with me? Yeah. All right. And so, and so from there, and so from there, so the Israel of God, it, 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 they call it a Bible class, uh, and, 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 which, is, which is very, very interesting. And so uh, it says, our purpose is to teach. Our purpose is to teach uh, the uncut word of God according to the prophets of the Old Testament and the apostles of the New. We observe the Lord's Sabbath, the Lord's feast, as outlined in Leviticus 23 the 23rd chapter, and the Lord's dietary law as outlined in Leviticus 11th chapter. We teach and observe the royal law, which is the Ten Commandments. Emphasis, right? Oh, I did have them in here. So these are the commandment keepers, the Ethiopian congregation of the living God, pillar and ground of truth. That's a long name. It's a long name. Good gracious alive. Some of y'all don't know, Epiphany Fellowship was going to have a long name at first until the Lord delivered us. I, don't ask me what it was going to be. <laughs> Yvette, don't say nothing, baby. I love you. I love you. I'm glad she talked me out of it. Thank God for wives. Amen. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, 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 modern strand of Hebrew Israelism. So, this, this strand actually is where a lot of the other strands come from, which you'll see in a second. Because a lot of the modern day strands come from them because they were more rabbinic in their orientation. This group right here. And they were deep, more deeply connected to the rabbinic and Jewish tradition than they were. So, so I want to I wanna help paint a picture before we get into everything, biblically and everything, historically, so that you can know that many of these groups weren't like they were today. It was, it was just them saying, hey, it was just basic identity seeking, and then they began, some of them became more Jewish, and some of them added it and blended in their Christianity. But one of the things that you'll see in every one of these groups is they're, they're, them seeking for their identity in some way, shape, or form, for some reason, ended up eclipsing the gospel of Jesus Christ in every single instance. And, 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 it, and it's very important we understand that, and we'll see why in a second, all right? So the commandment keepers church of the living God and the ground, the pillar of truth, or, or, or something, began, <laughs> this is too much, I just said, let me go on past, began as a Christian church in 1919, began as a Christian church, okay? A progressively incorporated more Jewish rituals and decrease the prominence. This is, the, this is not even a believer necessarily writing this. They, they decrease the prominence of Jesus as the decades passed. Use it, so so let, me just, let me just give you a quick disclaimer. I don't care about anybody saying they're Hebrew. I could care less. 
But when Jesus begins to decrease, that's when I begin caring. But it's very, very difficult when you, base, when you connect your physical identity to your spiritual identity. When you marry those two together, you get in trouble long term because you don't, you, you, you don't see yourself through the lens of your spiritual identity first as influencing your natural identity. You see your natural identity as influencing your spiritual identity, which is another gospel, and we'll see that in a second. Keep tracking with me. Y'all still with me, right? Amen. This is, this is, this is Pastor Dow, country in a mug, boy. He, 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 he's a fun guy to listen to, and he, he's, he has a straightway truth. He's in Tennessee. They have like this, um, they have like a compound out there. It's weird. They got a compound, but he's one of the only groups that believe that other people outside of African Americans can be uh, Israelites. Now, the challenge, though, is they use, and we'll see it later when we look at Isaiah 14 on the slavery passage, which we'll show that's been fulfilled, uh, 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 um, um, is that he utilizes that to say that there's a hierarchy, an ethnic hierarchy in, in the kingdom. So black, to, to those who are black, brown, Native American, all that, even though he believes in a broader Israel, um, they, everybody else is in a hierarchy under Israel, which we'll, which, which we'll see some of that later. One of the strange beliefs with them, so this may not seem strange, but it's very strange. He says, if you wish to bless Pastor Dow, this is on the front of the website. <laughs> and his community. Now that's on the website. Like I didn't make up these words, okay? With an offering, now they talk about us. Y'all don't believe in tithes and offerings, but y'all believe in blessing Pastor Dow, amen. With an offering, we greatly appreciate all tithes and offerings, I guess they do, go strictly, first in line, Pastor Dowell and his community. Now, did Moses ever call Israel his community? Now, if anybody had the right to say, this is my community, whenever God talked to Moses, what would God say to Moses? Somebody said it over there. There you go, my people. Moses never said my community. That just sounds already cultic. They are used, they, they, they are used to pay local community programs, even though y'all are all in the same community, learning and teaching materials, books, by, uh, building up our local community. Okay, so forth and so on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. Let me keep it moving. So this is, this is when, this, these two are interesting. So this is Moray and Halda. She wrote a book called Hidden in Plain Sight. Women love her. Like, if, if I mean, women love her. She has hundreds of thousands of views online. Um, and a lot of women listen to her because this is not, this, they, they, they are, they're very different in many ways the way they do with their community of the Awakening Remnant. Matter of fact, they started a group in Jersey recently. Um, and recently, and in New York. So they are planting movements. Now, Y'all still struggling with me, right? Yeah. Okay, I'm going to keep asking y'all that. Y'all just listening, ain't you? And so these two are interesting because you know when a cult is stabilizing when it gets in the middle class. See, when it's, when it's in lower class, folk, you can kind of write it off because it comes and goes every 20, 30 years. But when it hits the middle class, sociologically, usually, usually it's going to stabilize longer because it has the funding and it will begin developing the intellectual wherewithal, whether pseudo or not, to be able to fortify the way of thinking for a long-term time. Okay, and I've seen that just historically over and over and over and over again uh, uh, with the Nation of Islam. When it got from prisons and it began getting in the, on the college campuses and those blacks, it's, it's, I can keep going. So, so, so what are they about? What, what's their deal? So I'm not gonna read all this, but it says this, uh, we believe that the scriptures Old Testament, New Testament, is infallible, is, is the infallible word of Yahweh, or Yahuwah, some people say that, that Yahuwah or Yahweh is one and is expressly manifested. Stop right there. Whenever you see the word manifest, your antenna should always go up. Okay? Always remember that as an apologist. It's a, it's a famous preacher that says God presents himself in three manifestations. That's a sign of what's called modalism. We'll get to some stuff later. 
in, he said he manifested in numberless ways and that all these ways are the one true Yahweh. That's, that's, this is very strange. Now, Yehoshua HaMashiach is the word of Yahweh, the son of Yahweh manifested in the flesh and is the fullness of the, and is the, fullness of the Godhead bodily. What's missing? No, no, no. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But well, what's missing? Not G. Uh, not, I mean, Yahshua was Jesus. What, what? Holy Spirit is missing, but this is just about Jesus. What's missing? No. Say it louder. The deity of Christ. Now, somebody will say the Son of God. They don't know that when you say He's the Son of God, they're actually saying He's God. But that's not what they're saying. Now, the Holy Spirit is missing. You see? And so we can go on and on and on and on and on. Now, one of the things you'll see is, you see that salvation, we believe that salvation is by grace through faith and that, the only, that only by the shedding of innocent blood is remission of sins. Then they say, uh, they mention the Holy Spirit as the one that Jesus was born through a virgin through, but doesn't say he's a distinct person. That's very key. That's very key for you as a believer to make sure that you have your eye on those types of things, right? And look here. Now, we also believe in knowing the culture, language, idioms, blah, blah, blah. Then it says Yahweh is salvation, law. Huh? Is the Torah of Yah that leads to salvation by his grace through faith. The Torah is designed to bless the followers of Yahweh of Israel. Now, this is playful language because you'll really know their theology of them when you start looking at their videos, which I'm, I mean, you can if you want. I, I mean, you know it don't bother me because I believe you'll be kept. Now, look at what it says. It says, uh, what they don't tell you is that she believes the canon is still open. She said in a video recently that we're supposed to, Israelites are supposed to now continue writing the New Testament because we are the New Testament. She said that. She said, she said that. Now, she also teaches something called grammetria. Grammetria is, uh, is when you take letters of a language and utilize its number, its place in the alphabet, and particularly Hebrew, which m much of Hebrew language has a hieroglyphic visual that it represents in that culture. And you take that and interpret scriptures basically through Bible coding. So they not only, they don't just believe what's written, they create other doctrines based on this numerical system of grammatria, right? Y'all trying to track away, but it's rooted in the Kabbalah. <laughs> it's rooted in Kabbalah-isms, right? Now, here they go. These are the modern strands, the ISUPK, camps of IUIC, right? They're the ones, they, now these are the professional ones right here. Now, you'll see they, they had the women dressed in beautiful garb. The fellas, they had the slickest, uh, 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 um, um, I, uh, you know, I, I'm not trying to be funny, but it do look like, you know, it's a Christmas play going on, um, <laughs> even though people don't believe in Christmas. But it looks like it's just what it is. But they're very professional. These are the ones that are a little more grimy, right? These are the ones that are a little more grimy. And uh, actually, the bottom right is GMS. Sakari is the one up in the left. They believe... This group right here, their leader, Tahar, said online that in the kingdom, they'll be able to rape white women. And they believe that you can, that you can, that this is, I'm not making this up. I didn't even want to play it tonight. And they believe that if, if a girl's 12 years old and you ask her, Father, can I, that he can have sex with her. Right? Sakari kind of. Came, the, their leader came out of that, and they're, 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 they're not large. The largest group, the larger groups is this one right here and the one I showed you at first. So, but this is the bloodline of it. Y'all still with me? So here you have Abba Bivens, who comes out of the commandment keepers. So this is how the camps began in the 60s. So uh, 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 Abba Bivens... He was a grimy dude, could fight. He would, he would, he would knock cats out on the street. He was a grimy dude. And, um, and, those, and they had what's called seven heads. Um, as things progressed from 1969 all the way to the mid-90s, 
what ended up happening is, is there was a split. This guy here to the right called Tazadak, Tazadakia, Wanye is a part of his group. Wanye from Boys to Men. Yeah, that, y'all didn't know what I was talking about. Y'all say, Wanye, Wanye? Yeah, Wanye, Wanye. <laughs> yeah, Wanye, Wanye is a Hebrew Israelite. And I thought it was over, but somebody saw him in the store, and he was trying to talk to them about Hebrew Israelism just last week. So he's, he's under that group. Now, he just got arrested, him and another leader, for um, basically um, embezzling $5.3 million. You know, taking their kids to Disney World, cars, everything, right? Now, we're not saying all Hebrew Israelites is like this, but, you know, they talk about the church deal, but then they have their situations, Right? So this is kind of like their bloodline in which they come down into in the sense of their functional ways in which all of these groups are now come from Abba Bivens. Now, one of the things that's, some of the things, oh, one more to begin, I just told y'all that. So I have to go over all of that. Okay, Abba Bivens died fighting on the street. So what are their unifying distinctives? Because I want to move. What are some of their unifying distinctives? African Americans are the original Hebrew Israelites. That's one of their unifying distinctives, okay? Many camps would say that the so-called blacks, Hispanics, and Native Americans, many camps, probably most camps, never, remember I'm emphasizing camps because I want to make sure that we don't um, blanket all Hebrew Israelites as being the same because it's not fair, right? Because all of them are not the same and all of them don't act as belligerent as many of the camps do. Native Americans are original Hebrew Israelites. The law as central to salvation and justification and covenant connection. So what do I mean by that? Uh, And we'll break that down in a minute. But the law is central in relation to uh, to salvation, whether they, even if they believe in justification by faith, they still believe that you're covenantly kept by your commitment to the law, okay? Um, Most believe only salvation, uh, uh, only in the, the salvation of Israel, right? Uh, they'll use passages we'll see later, like Revelation, which says it's 12 gates and only Israel went in it. But then after that, you see all of these people later on in Revelation 22 who are of all the nations going into the same temple. So anyway, just you got to read your Bible. Key beliefs and distinctives. Uh, the continuation of the law into the new covenant. All African-Americans are Hebrew Israelites, Deuteronomy 28. Whites will be enslaved in the, in the kingdom of... I'm going to say, I say Isaiah 14 first, that's for another passage, that's on their hermeneutics. Isaiah 28 is how they talk about and work through um, the idea of slavery among uh, 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 um, um, whites and others. And Jesus became, uh, Jesus came to save Israel only. You'll hear them also use the Psalms to talk about he only revealed his statutes to Israel. But if you understand how that works, Israel was supposed to get it first and then it was supposed to go to the Gentiles. So when they read that, they think it's, it's reading only for Israel. He's, he's basically saying, yes, Israel was a special people. And he did reveal it to him, but they had a responsibility to be a missiological kingdom of priests. We'll see that in a second. All right? Uh, key beliefs and distinctives. Uh, one of the other things is the 12 tribes chart. I don't know how they get this. I don't know how we, like, got dropped off in, like, the right places when they were mixing all of us together. Now, now, all the Hebrew Israelites don't believe in the 12 tribes car, chart. Mostly the camps do. So this is kind of their chart to say, so you know, Pastor Nyron, where you at? Let me see. <laughs> where, where the Jamaicans at? I don't see the Jamaicans. Dag, you ain't Israel, man. <laughs> West Indians, okay. You Benjamin, doc. You West Indians? You West Indian? Trinidad and Tobago, boy. All right. <laughs> Any Dominicanos in here? None. Okay. So that, that's your tribe. Check, your, check out and find out where your tribe is. But all jokes aside, they use Genesis 48 and take very stereotypical, under, very racist, stereotypical understandings of different groups and localizes them to these groups of people. Okay? So, so which, which, is, which is very, very weird. Okay. They also believe in, that King James is the only inspired Bible because King James was a black Israelite. (laughs) 
King James is a black Israelite who wanted to create an uncorruptible Bible. He was an Anglican. Anglican. But they showed this picture to say that what they used, though, all jokes aside, what they used is they utilized the Moorish history of the, the Moors who went into Scotland and they, during the Dark Ages after the Moorish Empire was conquered and used that as a mechanism to say, see, King James, and they ran Europe during their particular empire, and that's him right there. And this has been debunked a hundred times over. Uh, and, and when you begin, even if you read the original King James 611 translation, and you read in the beginning of the book, uh, you begin to see that it was written for all people. And as a matter of fact, they affirmed other translations in the translation of the King James Version of the Bible, right? Uh, not included other versions, affirmed other versions, rather, in the beginning. They're not saying this is the only translation, this is the best translation, this is another translation, right? Um, they, they, uh, uh, key beliefs and distinctives. They have uh, a language that they've created called the Lashawan Kadesh, or the Holy Tongue. So, and, and so they've taken everything out, all the vowels out that the Masoretes put in in the second century and basically used the, word, the letter A. And that's all, and, 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 and made the I in the I, and that's basically it. So Jesus is Yahawashai. I don't know who that is, right? Which is a fake for a, a Hebrew that Ariah, the guy back up there, made. And then they believe Isaiah 28, 10 through 13, is promoting the way in which we are to interpret and read Scripture. We'll see that in a second, right? All right. So let's dig in. Y'all ready? All right, um, brother, grab for me uh, Deuteronomy twenty-eight sixty-eight. Here we go. In the King James, do it in the King James. Yeah. So this is one of their core beliefs and distinctives. And we'll come back to this in a second to show uh, uh, several things about this passage. But they basically believe that African Americans, based on this verse, um, were brought in slave ships here, or Africans, or, or, or Israelites, rather, from their perspective, was brought here in ships. And they believe that this is metaphorical Egypt because Mizraim, which is the Hebrew name for Egypt, means a uh, 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 house of bondage or house of slavery, right? <laughs> so they believe that we're them. And so, they, so, he, so when you go through Deuteronomy 28, you'll see a lot of different things that literally look like they correlate with some of the experiences that African Americans had. It says, you know, that foreigners and immigrants and that type of thing, they'll, they, they'll be over you and that type of thing. But then, they, th th then right here, once you get here in chapter, chapter 28, verse 68, you'll see that they'll say, the Lord shall bring thee into Egypt again. Now, you can't make this metaphorical Egypt now when he says the same place again. Which ships? By the way, wherefore I spake unto thee, and they like the King James because of the ambiguity of the old language. Thou shalt see it no more, Hey, uh, as a matter of fact, uh, uh, Mike, grab, uh, grab it in the CSB. And then he says, thou shalt see it no more again, and there ye shall be sold unto your enemies for bondsmen. Okay? So now we're saying you'll be sold. Of a bondsman and bondswomen, but listen, and no man shall buy you. Now what does that tell you? No one was bought. Who tried to sell themselves? Now, the issue is, this, the, the King James translation doesn't show the proper pronouns because of the way the structure of the language is. Now, read for me out of the CSB translation real quick. Verse 68. The Lord will take you back in ships to Egypt by a route that I said you would never see again. There you will sell yourselves to your enemies as male and female slaves, but no one will buy you. You will sell yourselves. So what is that pointing back to? The Levitical laws on slavery. Because what happens is, is when you, in, in their culture, and this is, this is a quick slavery lesson, because they didn't like have the unemployment line like on good times. 
You remember they used to go on the unemployment line, the lady be chewing gum and treating JJ bad? Y'all remember that? All right. Whatever, y'all. Anyway. But in that unemployment, uh, they didn't have unemployment offices back then. It was an agricultural nomadic society. So you weren't going to go somewhere and just necessarily look for jobs all the time. And stuff wasn't available, particularly if you're an alien in another country. Are you tracking with me? So if you went to another country, a lot of people would shun you because you're not from that particular country. Therefore, the only thing left for them to do is attempt to sell themselves into slavery. Because selling yourself into slavery is a way to get food and clothing. Now, back then, all slavery wasn't like our slavery, so you can't equate American slavery with Middle Eastern slavery, okay? And so this is more a form of indentured servitude, which you know in Israelite slavery, you got out of slavery in the seventh year, right? And there were laws on even how to treat a person. But when we talk about this, this is not Israelite slavery. This is slavery in another context where God has sent them because they have been disobedient to Yahweh. And so now they're trying to sell themselves into slavery. And he said, you're going to have it so bad because of your idolatry and your disobedience to me that you won't, no one will even want to buy you. Because God wanted to send that as a covenant sign of his rebuke of them because of their sin. Amen. All right? Now, the question, though, is now, now, we got a historian in here and some other ones. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't know that anybody got here and tried to sell themselves into slavery on American soil. Uh, we had like a middle passage thing that happened. We had like people march from the interior of Africa and got put together. And we were all thrown on the slave ships equally. And so how in the world do you have all of these different people groups who are from different cultures and languages now get put on there and then they just distribute each tribe equally, even though they ran out in 70 AD. Oh, God help me. It's, 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 it's a lot to work through. We'll, we'll, we'll work through it in a second. We'll work through it in a second. Y'all still dragging with me? All right. Jesus is black. Grab for me Revelation. Chapter 1. Verses 14 through 15. Money looks serious than a mug. Woo-wee. Woo. He like he looking right at you, don't he? That's your Howard shy. Your Howard shy. Grab that revelation, fellas, for me real quick. Revelation 1 in the King James Version, though. Grab that. Because I want to show them in their King James translation. Um, now, I'm not trying to be what they would call a coon. Because, see, what I'm about to prove is based on the same Bible they read, if you just read it. You don't even have to know Greek or Hebrew, Syriac, Aramaic, Ugaritic, Arcadian. <laughs> you don't have to know any of it, okay? Read verse 14 and 15 for me. His head and his hairs were white like wool. Stop. His what? His head and his hairs were like, white like wool. Again? His head and his hairs were white like wool. So his head is what? <laughs> the Greek word for head is head. <laughs> Keep reading. As white as snow, and his eyes were as a flame of fire, and his feet like unto fine brass, as if they burned in a furnace, and his voice as the sound of many waters. Stop. Now, what color is his ankles, his feet and stuff? What is it? It didn't say brown. Don't add to the words. <laughs> That's not what it said. What does it say? Fine brass. Like brass. Like burnt like brass. Now, if brass is being burnt, it actually lights up to bright orange. So if you're taking this to literally say that this is here to picture Jesus' color, then that means he's two different colors. He's white and orange. I mean, the text you're trying to prove that he's black says his head, and I think your face is a part of your head, right. is white. 
So, not just culturally, but because they're, do I have any English majors in here, English teachers? What do you see English-wise, just based on reading this passage that you see in here, that lets you know some things? Like, like. Yep, like and what? What are those called? Similes and metaphors. <laughs> English 101, Pastor Kerr. <laughs> English 101. And so when you look at, you don't even have to now, read, read that in the CSB translation, brother. Read, read that, John, in the CSB. We're going we to get it in the modern translation, and we're going to get it in the CSB translation. Read, read that for me real quick. Go ahead. The hair of his head was white as wool, white as snow, and his eyes like a fiery flame. His feet were like fine bronze as it is fired in a furnace, and his voice like the sound of cascading waters. Now, that's a better translation of that because it brings out both. Now, one of the things that we, we have to see is we're not saying that Jesus was a white man. We're not saying that he was an orange man. But in this text, you also can't say he's a what? So you don't, you, this text has nothing to do with color. It's all symbolism about his royal might. Actually, the white is pointing to him glowing, not his facial color. Brass is, 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 is talking about royal prowess. I ain't got time to preach that. But it's, it's so much in there that you miss out on when you... Now, see how... Your, see, but, but, but this is what I want you to hear, what I'm saying. See how the impact of ethnic dignity, destruction, can even affect just a simple reading of the Bible. It's just a simple reading of the Bible. So we're affirming, amen, that blacks in this country, people of color in this country, have, have had dignity assassination. However, we don't replace it with lying. Like, we don't replace it with that. We, we replace it with allowing the Mago Day and the Mago Creek, who I don't want to get ahead of myself, to influence us based on the might of the gospel. So let's look at some mechanisms of engagement. Let's look at some mechanisms of engagement, right? So when we talk about mechanisms of engagement, uh, grab for me 1 Corinthians, uh, uh, Glenn, grab for me 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4, and then uh, 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 Nico, grab for me uh, uh, Romans chapter 1, verse 16. Grab those for me. Now as we look at this, we want to look at the content and clarity of the gospel, but also the scope of the gospel. Somebody say scope. scope. Yeah, so what we want to do is we want to look at both of these as we talk about the nature and purpose of the gospel and begin to lay out and get a broader understanding and framework of what God wants us to see and understand as it pertains to the scriptures. 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4. Hit it up for me. CSB? Yep. All right. Now I want to make clear for you, brothers and sisters, the gospel I preached to you, which you received, on which you have taken your stand, by which you are being saved. If you hold to the message I preached to you, Unless you believed in vain. Yeah. For I passed on to you as most important. Let's say that again. Also, most important. Say that again. Most important. Yeah, read it. What I also received, that Christ died for our sins yeah. according to the scriptures. Yeah. That he was buried. That he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. So, so, so go back. He said it's of what importance? Most. What's your nationality? What did they call it? Most important, right? That's very, very important. So the first thing we should be going to people is not what's your ethnicity. We talking about the Apostle Paul, who the Bible says was the Hebrew of Hebrews, tribe of Benjamin, uh, uh, circumcised on the eighth day. He said, but I count it all scupula. It means duology. He, he counts his ethnicity as toilet matter in the surpassing greatness of knowing Christ as Lord. Wow. So we're talking about the dude that's the real Hebrew. You understand what I'm saying? They spoke actual Hebrew, Aramaic, and Latin, and uh, 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 Greek, right? So, so read, for me, uh, read for me Romans 1.16. Uh, for I am not ashamed of the gospel, because it is the power of God for salvation 
to everyone who believes, first to the Jew and also to the Greek. First to who? To the Jew. And then to who? The Greek. And first to who? The Jew. And then to who? The Greek. Yeah. So when we look at this and we understand that, that, that and they'll try to say, no, nah, no, nah, that word ethnos, brother, you know, brother C, the white man has gotten you mixed up because that's the, that's the, that's the ten northern tribes of Israel. And see, being that those were the scattered northern tribes of Israel, see, when the word Gentile, they're in a Gentile state of mind. And so the, the, the salvation is only for Israel. So, be, 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 but was it the Jude, was it Jesus, Jesus preaching to the, the, the Jude, Judah as well? And so they weren't, in a, they, they weren't in a Gentile state of mind as well? Even though it says that Christ had representatives, God had representatives of himself in every city where Moses is preached. So how can you say that the Hellenized Jews, even though they were speaking Greek and not emphasizing Hebrew, oh, help me, God, are the, only, are, are the ones who are functioning in a Gentile state of mind and not, the, Jew, uh, not the, the groups within Judah when biblically all of them were scattered? Okay? And so when we look at this mechanism of gospel engagement, we got to be clear on the gospel. Somebody say clear on the gospel. Now, I preach this on Sunday, but you have to be very, very clear on the gospel. And that means that we're going to have to, and we're going to work through it just a little bit tonight as an introduction, where you and I learn how to have a very, very keen understanding of passages, yeah. of verses. Yeah. Not just, I know he did it, he, he took care of me. <laughs> I was blind, but now I see. I gave the preacher my hand and God my heart. That's all I know. Man, I felt that peace after he preached. Ain't, ain't no Holy Ghost in none of that as it pertains to the biblical depths that we have to have in our life, right? So we talk about this. We talk about what the gospel is and what the gospel does. The gospel is, the, it, 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 what the gospel is, is the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. The scope of the gospel is what the gospel does in the lives of people. So what we're talking and in our lives. So salvation for the Hebrew Israelites uh, grab for me a uh, revelation. Grab uh, Revelation 22. Uh, grab James chapter two, verses 14 through 24. Uh, Glenn, grab grab the second. The second one, grab the James passage. Uh, Nico, grab the Revelation passage for me. So when we look at this. Some say you are justified by faith, and then others say that you are saved by both faith and works. So what you'll run across in, in, in family members or whoever you would, you would find that's talking about these different things is they'll say, now you're saved by grace through faith in Christ. However, you have to keep the laws and statutes and commandments. Now, when we talk about that laws and statutes and commandments um, uh, uh, and talking about that reality, um, we, we're going we're gonna to get ready and go. Matter of fact, I wasn't going to go there tonight. Uh, guess you'll grab for me uh, 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 um, 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 Acts 15. Acts chapter 15. So, so, so hit that revelation passage for me first. Blessed are those who wash their robes so that they may have the right to the tree of life and may enter the city by the gates. Okay. Read, uh, uh, now read, uh, read that one more time. Blessed are those who wash their robes so that they may have the right to the tree of life and may enter the city by the gates. All right. Next one. Is that verse 14? 22, 14? Yes. That's 22, 14? Okay. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yours is James. I just, oh, I got it. I got it. Hold on. I got James. Oh, you got James? Okay, got you, got you. My bad. What good is it, my brothers and sisters, if someone claims to have faith but does not have works? Can such faith save them, save him? If a brother or sister is without clothes and lacks daily food, and one of you says to them, go in peace, stay warm, and be well fed, but you don't give them what the body needs, what good is it? In the same way, faith if it doesn't have works, it's dead by itself. But someone will say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your, your faith without works and I will show you faith by my works. Yeah. You believe that God is one. Good. Even the demons believe. Yeah. And they shudder. Senseless person. You stop that. You stop that. You oh. stop that. You good. You good. You good. So what you see is what they'll go to this passage and say, yeah, we believe in faith, but we believe in faith plus works. And what they'll do is they'll say, you're not, just, you're not just justified by faith alone. You're justified by faith and works. And so they'll use this passage as a mechanism to do that. And the average Christian will be like, hey, that sounds weird. No, know, know how weird this is? You're not, in, you're, you're not in bad company, okay? Because Martin Luther wanted to tear the book of James out of the canon. Because he, he, had, he, had, he, had, he discovered Romans 5.1 and was blown away that we're justified by faith. But as he was reading through his Bible and got to James, he was like, how does this, 
how does this, even Luther was trying to, Martin Luther was trying to, Martin, not Martin Luther King, for y'all be like, Martin Luther King? I saw some of y'all said, wow. Right? Right. Some of y'all thought, I'm talking about Martin Luther, the, the reformer, the white German dude, right? <laughs> some of y'all said, I didn't mean, know Martin Luther King was in it like that. He was exegeting him. All I know is I have a dream, right? He was in that text. And so, but this is what we're going to do. Answer. How do you answer them? You got a couple, Revelation 22, with Romans 3.20. Grab Romans 3 from the, uh, uh, Romy Nico. You got to answer that. And then, Glenn, grab, uh, grab 1 John 5, 11 through 13. Uh, same person who wrote Revelation. The Revelation passage said... First John, you understand? Know Same dude. So go ahead and uh, go ahead and do, do me a favor. Read, read that Romans three twenty. For no one will be justified in his sight by the works of the law, mm -hmm. because the knowledge of sin comes through the law. Say that again. For no one will be justified in his sight by the works of the law, uh -huh. because the knowledge of sin comes through the law. All right. Give me that First John five eleven through thirteen. And this is the testimony. Come on. God has given us eternal life. Uh huh. And this life is in his son. Come on. The one who has the son has life. Uh huh. The one who does not have the son of God does not have life. Uh huh. I have written these things to you who believe in the name of the son of God so that you may know that you have eternal life. Who do you have life by? The who? The works of the law. I thought you had to do the works of the law in order to have life. Wow. Wow. So the same person who wrote Revelation, Revelation 22, uh, 14, wrote this passage. We'll talk about that in a second as we go through this. Now, let's break down this answer. Grab for me, Nico, uh, John 13, 34, and Matthew, and then get Matthew 4, 14. Get Galatians, uh, Galatians uh, 6, 2. And because we're talking about back, let me, let me, let me get it from, from here. So when you go back to Revelation uh, 22, 14, one of the things that it says in the King James, it, it says it here in verse 14. It says, blessed are they that do his commandments, that they may have a right to the tree of life. So what will happen is, the Hebrew Israelite will say to you, see, you got to do his commandments to have a part to the tree of life. So which commandments are you talking about? The laws, the prophets, the laws, the statutes, and prophets. But when you see law and commandments in the New Testament, unless it's specifically verified, there is a new law and commandments we're under. Now, the question is, what are those laws and commandments? Go ahead and get that, uh, get that John 13, 34 for me. I give you a new command. Uh-oh, stop right there. <clears throat> Who's speaking here? So why in the world would he be giving us a new commandment like he's somebody? <laughs> Keep going. Love one another. Just as I have loved you, you are also to love one another. And they'll say, well, you love one another by keeping the commandments and not committing adultery with your neighbor's wife and covenant. Okay, cool. We agree with that to a certain level so you can understand what we're saying. Read Matthew chapter 4. Uh, verse 14, and then grab Galatians 2 and Matthew 28 and Matthew 5. Uh, uh, we don't have to grab Matthew 5 and 7. Go, go ahead to the next one. Matthew 4, 14. This was to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet Isaiah. So when you look at that again, go, no, go ahead, go ahead, read it, read it. What was fulfilled? Read it again? Yeah. No, what uh, was fulfilled? Uh, oh, land of, you want me to keep reading? Yeah. Uh, no worries, we're going to come back to that. Grab Galatians yeah. 6, 2 for me. Yeah. Grab Galatians 6, 2 for me. Carry one another's burdens. In this way, you will fulfill the law of Christ. So what is the law of Christ? What does that come from now? Say that again. Loving God with all your heart. So when you look at this idea of working through what it means to talk about Christ's commandments, you will see a bunch of his commandments and laying this out in relation to, and we're going to come back to that James passage, but don't think I forgot about it. Um, it is it, it, laying out what it means to fulfill the law. The law is fulfilled in one word. is that you love your neighbor as yourself. 
So, so, so when we talk about bearing one another's burdens in chapter 6, verse 2, it's an application of that. That's why when you look at the one another's, like, uh, like in uh, 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 Hebrews chapter 10 and in Th 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, uh, it'll talk about encouraging one another, spur one another on to love and good deeds. Those are all applications of that. Love your enemies yeah. is a Christ command. So when it talks about keeping his commands, it's talking about those commands. Mm -hmm. But is he null of that? Oh, I'm going to get ahead of myself. I don't want to get to the uh, Matthew 5, 17 yet. So we're going to get to that. And, uh, and when we look at the Matthew 5, 17, you'll see Ma Jesus is upgrading the application of the law. Yes. We're going to see that. He's upgrading the application of the law to see what the fuller sense of the meaning of the law is in relation to heart conditions versus just work conditions. Yes. We're going to see that in a second. So now, here we go. <laughs> I like this. Now grab James 2.21 and grab James 2.23. You grab Genesis 22 and grab Genesis 15.6. Okay, so now, when you look at, now, now what we're going to see is people like to use James as an example for what it means for faith and works to work, to, 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 to basically put faith, faith and works against each other. And we're going to see what James is talking about. James is not talking about justification of declaration of righteousness. We'll see that in a second. But he's talking about fruit bearing. So when you, we're going to show he even has it in the text and gives you both passages that lets you know that it's talking about fruit bearing. Now watch what the text says. Now read for me James 121. I mean 221, I'm sorry. Wasn't Abraham our fathers justified by works in offering Isaac his son on the altar? Now justification here, he switches his uses of justification to not mean declaration of righteousness, but showing forth that you are righteous. Now, up in Genesis 22, everybody turn to Genesis 22. Everybody in the church, building, because you the church. Somebody say you the church. So when we turn over to Genesis 22, right, you turn over there, because I want you to see this. Building. I want you to use your pages if you have them, because you can't really fill it if you use your phone on this one. You're not going to fill it. Sometimes you need some pages, all that phone stuff, man. Some stuff you should just not get rid of. So look at this. Now, we're after Isaac's birth. Isaac's a young buck. God has gone through all of this to make sure. We're going to take a break in a second. Um, God does all of this to make sure uh, that he had this child. And this, after these things, God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham, he said, here I am. He said, he answered, take your son, he said, your only son, Isaac, whom you love, go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering. On, the, on one of the mountains, I will tell you about. So Abraham got up early in the morning and saddled his ducky and took with him two of his young men and his son, Isaac. He split wood and for burnt offering and set out to go. Look at all he's going through. To go to the place God had told him about. On the third day, Abraham looked up and saw the place in the distance. Then Abraham said to his men, stay here with the donkey. The boy and I will go over there to worship. Then we'll be back. I gave y'all something to preach. He said, we'll come back. <laughs> Hebrew said his faith was so strong in God, he believed God was going to raise him up from the dead. Because he said, God can't. Can you see Abraham? He said, God is not a liar. So he can't say, this is my seed and the world going to be blessed through him. So he's never failed me. So we're probably going to come back together. I'm going to do this. And he's going to resurrect him. And... We're going to come back together. That's what he believed. <laughs> Somebody said, I ain't never seen that. It says, Abraham took the wood for the burnt offering 
and laid it on his son. Ain't that something? He carried wood up a hill. Don't that sound familiar? And then laid the wood on his son. And the father, in his hand, took the fire and kindled the knife. It pleased him to crush his son. Isaiah 53. <laughs> and two of them walked on together. Then Isaac spoke to his father, Abraham, saying, uh, my father. <laughs> um, that's, <laughs> he respectful to the mug. <laughs> he replied, here I am, my son. Isaac, the fire and the wood are here, but where is the lamb? Oh, my God for the burnt offering. Abraham answered, God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. Then the two of them walked on together when they arrived at the place that God had told them, Abraham built an altar there and arranged the wood. He bound his son Isaac and placed him on the altar of tub of wood. Then Abraham reached out and took the knife and to slaughter his son. But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. He replied, here I am. Then he said, do not lay a hand on the boy or do anything to him, for now I yada, that you fear God. Now, what does this have to do with that passage? Read James 2.21 again. Wasn't Abraham our father justified by works in offering Isaac his son on the altar? God said, now I know. Now, that doesn't mean God didn't know because he knows all things actual and potential. It's just he entered into the experience by speaking anthropomorphically in the experience with Abraham of saying he experienced something with him, but God already knew it was going to happen. God already experienced it. He was already there before Abraham went up there and experienced it even though he had already was there. Anyway, James 2.23, read that. And the scripture was fulfilled that says, Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness, and he was called God's friend. Hold on. Now, let me ask you this. Now, when did God justify Abraham? Hold on. Y'all not listening. James is saying there was a practical justification that was seen in Genesis 22. But turn, turn over to Genesis. Turn over to Genesis 15, 6 and read that thing. Abram believed the Lord, and he credited it to him as righteousness. Stop right there. So Genesis 22 was the fruit bearing of the justification that he already had in Genesis chapter 15, verse 6. So he didn't get saved in Genesis 22. He got saved in Genesis chapter 15, verse 6, but sometimes God had to put you through a test to show you whether or not you was actually walking with him and whether you would bear fruit of the salvation that he already gave you. So when you try to use this passage to say you're justified by faith, he, no, he's saying, no, if you're a real believer, you'll be obedient. So notice the placement of the passage. Genesis 22, Genesis 15, 6. He, he, he quoted Genesis 15, 6 in, in, over in James, but, but, but it's after where he bears, where he shows the fruit of his salvation. That's very, very important. Y'all still tracking with me? So this is, a, this is a good commentary on the book of James um, by Bloomberg. It's a dope commentary on James. There's a lot of good commentaries on James. But, I mean, I'd be wanting to put so much in these <laughs> presentations, but I was like, I can't put everything. So, somebody said, yes, you can. Who said that? Gesher. Uh, of course, Gesher said that. And so, um, and so, one of the answers, again, so he says, in essence, he said, in essence, works are the sum total of a changed life brought about by faith, where Paul denies the need for the pre-conversion works, James emphasizes here the absolute necessity of post-conversion works. Okay, uh, get, 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 grab for me, um, grab for me, Glenn. Grab Second Thessalonians chapter uh, one, verse verse eleven. Um, 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 yeah, yeah. Um, grab, grab, um, grab that. 
And uh, yeah, grab that for me. It says, James emphasizes the absolute necessity of post-conversion works. James calls a faith that does not bring about cha a changed life dead. Lifeless and useless. It does not work to save a person for it cannot lacking life itself. As David summarizes this, talking about this, um, this other commentator, a faith which is purely doctrinal and does not result in pious action is a dead sham. Totally useless for salvation. Read that 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 11 for me. In view of this, we always pray for you that our God will make you worthy of his calling and by his power fulfill your every desire to do good and your work produced by faith. Amen. Produ every work produced by what? Faith. See that? You see in the scriptures, just, you know, that, 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 that faith produces works. Works doesn't produce faith. That's, that's so important for us to recognize and understand. Um, thank you, Holy Spirit, for reminding me of that verse. Um, yeah, so, so, so let's, let's, let's go to the next one, y'all. Let's, let's roll through. All right, so answer. Salvation Hebrew Israelites says, look at this, y'all. Since we are talking about the fruit of the Spirit, what are they? My bad. I'll edit that. But the fruit of the Spirit is what? Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. Uh huh. The law is not against such things. Now the question is, do a lot of them exhibit these? See, these. Th this is what. The fruit of the spirit is. Or like they said, the fruit of the ruach or hypnumata. Right? So now let's look at Matthew 5, 17. <laughs> so let's look at this. Um, grab for me these verses, fellas. John, uh, uh, Nico, grab a uh, John 19, 28 through 30. Uh, Glenn, grab Acts chapter 24, 48 through I mean, 44 through 48, guess, grab, Acts 3, 18. All right. So one of the things that you'll hear them say when we go here, matter of fact, um, let's, let's, let's grab that Matthew 5, 17. Let's grab it all together, Matthew 5, 17. Now, this is an important verse um, because, I mean, I could really spend the whole time just on talking about this verse. Okay? When you look at Matthew 5, 17, he says, verse, chapter 6, verse 5, 17, here we go. He says, do not think that I came to abolish the law or the prophets. So, he's, he's, so he equates the two as equal. The law isn't greater than the prophets, and the prophets isn't uh, 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 greater than the law. Okay? He says, I did not come to abolish, but to fulfill. So when we talk about that, and we can read the rest of that, for truly I tell you, until heaven and earth pass away, not the smallest letter or stroke of the letter will pass away from the law until all these things are accomplished. Yes. Now, we have to understand what plurao, or the, the Greek word filled. Somebody say filled. Yeah. So we talk about fulfilled, plurao, they, they, think it, they say it means to do the law. Now, if fulfilled means to do the law, that means fulfilled means to do the prophets. Now, let me ask you a question. Matthew talks about, or, or Luke, talks about Jesus going into his parents, taking him into Egypt. He was a baby. Then it said when he returned, he said, out of Egypt, I've called my son. <clears throat> did Jesus do that or did his parents take him? Did his parents do that or did he do it? His parents. So if his parents do it, and it says this is written in order that the prophet may be fulfilled, if, if fulfilled means do, 
He didn't do anything. He was passively active in it, mm. but it was God providentially utilizing his parents to bring it to pass, but he didn't do it himself. Mm -hmm. So if fulfill always means do, mm. then it can't mean that all the time. That's why you have to have good lexicons. Now, um, now, now, now look at this. So they'll pull out a bunch of verses on law keeping from the Old Testament. And then they'll pull out verses in actual the passages that actually is not even talking about the law of Moses, Romans, Galatians, and 1 John on the law that have to do with the law of Christ, like we saw earlier. So um, let, let's grab those verses, fellas. John, so what does fulfill mean? Go ahead. John 19, verses 28 through 30. Go ahead, hit that up. After this, when Jesus knew that everything was now finished, that the scripture might be fulfilled, he said, I'm thirsty. A jar full of sour wine was sitting there, so they fixed a sponge full of sour wine on a hyssop branch and held it up to his mouth. When Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, it is finished. Then bowing his head, he gave up his spirit. So fulfilled means accomplishing what was said beforehand and it coming to pass. And it comes to pass based on something that was communicated previously. Now when we talk about the law being fulfilled, although the law isn't purely prophetic, there are prophetic elements that are in the law. Let me say that again. Although the law isn't purely prophetic, there are prophetic things within the law. We'll see that in a second. Luke 24, 44 through 48. Read that. He told them, these are my words that I spoke to you while still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms must be fulfilled. So the things written about him in the law and the prophets might be fulfilled, not him doing the law as a way to fulfill the law. <laughs> now, how do you fulfill the law? Love God, love neighbor. Now, who did that the best? Okay? So if you want to put it on the doing side, right? Now, now read, read, uh, read, that, read that Acts passage. Oh, no, that was Luke. That was the Luke passage, right? Read the, uh, read the Acts passage. In this way, God fulfilled what he had predicted through all the prophets, that his Messiah would suffer. It's simple. He's trying to get his, uh, <laughs> come on, some, uh, that joke up, man, talking about some, this is the quiet storm. <laughs> You're listening to smooth jazz. <laughs> All jokes aside, so as you're looking at this, and I want you to go back to these verses. These are, these are, this is just the tip of the iceberg of talking about the way in which fulfillment works. When it talks about prophecy just coming to pass is fulfillment. It was spoken and it came to pass. That's what fulfillment means. So when Jesus said, I did not come to destroy it, I didn't come to do away with it as if it didn't exist. Both the law and the prophets, I came so that everything spoken about me in the prophets would come to pass. That's what he's saying. That's the main point of it, right? Now look at the word fulfill. Plu ra'u is the Greek word. Um, and it means temporarily and spatially. The coming to pass, this is a real lexicon. This is not like, like um, the baby Zondervan joint they be using. And this is like a real lexicon. Now, I'm not saying that arrogantly. I'm just trying to let you know. And so it's not Strong's Concordance. The, these, are, these are more robust commentaries that give far-reaching etymology of a word. All right? And so it says the coming to pass of the days of one's life or of prophecies, promises and intentions. Nearly all biblical references to fulfillment, both in the Old and New Testaments, listen, can be understood on this basis. Like, and so when we look at this, now let me explain to you how you do a word study on something. For those, how many of y'all did Bible study methods when we did the Bible study methods class? We gotta do it over again, ain't enough of y'all take it. We gotta, we gotta do that over again. Somebody say, do it again. 
And so um, when we talk about this, when you do a word study, the, the helps that we use in our word studies basically do this. Is, is, is it basically you have guys who have gone into all of these different language, all of these different people groups and documents that are original sources where words were used. They do third grade context clues, create categories for how it was used, and then import them into our deals and then couple it up with passages that reflect the usage in its original context. That's, that's how you do exegetical work. Not just saying something means something because it's convenient to the doctrine that you want to promote. Okay, so, so that's very important. Like, just because you want to promote your particular doctrine, no, we got to be, there's sometimes my sermons get messed up because something that I want to say is not what the text is actually saying. So then I have to rework the whole thing because in order to be faithful, I have to say what God says, not what I think is going to shout you. All right? And so that's more important. I'd rather you live right than shout right. Now, now, look at this. Now, I know they're small. I'm sorry, seniors. I'm sorry. I know they're like, the Lord know I can't see that. Somebody said that, right? <laughs> Somebody said, but they're doing the glasses all like that. I'm sorry. So it is therefore probable that when he contrasts abolish, this is good, with fulfilled, you should take a picture of this. He is speaking simply about obeying the requirements of the law and the prophets. Fulfill rather than obey do keep would not be the natural way to say this. He's not even, this is a white guy not even thinking about Hebrew Israelites. Mm. Right? And he's saying, he said, that's not even the natural way, way to, to say this. And such a sense would not answer the charge of aiming to abolish. Okay? So what does he say? He said, in Matthew's gospel, the verb purau, fulfill, plays a prominent role. Now, let me explain something to you all. One of the things the Hebrew Israelites do, and we'll get to it in a second, is they talk about precept upon precept, line upon line, here a little, there a little. I'm going to go there and debunk that whole thing in a few minutes. But, but one of the things that they don't do is they don't take the word being used here and say, how, how does this author normally use this word? Most New Testament authors, particularly people like John, who uses a lot of triple and double entendre. Triple and double entendre means double meaning. But, or triple meaning. But what he'll do in, in, in using these rhetorical devices is he'll have a way in which he uses the word. Matthew the same way. Let me give you an example. When Matthew, uh, 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 matter of fact, let's go to John. When John uses the word, in, in the, a phrase that all of the synoptic gospels use, when I say synoptics, synoptics are the ones that are synonymous to one another, Matthew through Luke, Matthew, Mark, Luke. John is not a synoptic, but it's a gospel because he doesn't tell the story the same way. But he tells the same story. Can somebody get that at home? And, um, and so when he uses the word and they followed him early in the book, he's using a rhetorical device to lead to the word that is used. That phrase points to being a disciple. And he'll use that over and over and over and over and over again. And what you do is say, how does this person use that? Paul uses the term in Christ a lot, which talks about the doctrine of us being placed in Christ. And that's how you get understanding the word. So when we get here to fulfill, you don't just say it means to do because it fits your law-keeping philosophy. No, how is the author using the word fulfill? Is anywhere in that book of that particular author, does he use the word fulfill that way? No. Look at what this guy says, family. He said in Matthew's gospel, the word plurao <clears throat> uh, plays a prominent role, most notably in its ten occurrences in the formula quotations, <clears throat> where it denotes the coming into being of that to which scriptures pointed forward. Where does that come from? He went to every usage of the word fulfilled and looked at the context clues and said, this is how Matthew likes to use this word. Mm -hmm. Then if you want to go to others, <coughs> you go to other places in the Bible where it says it is fulfilled, do the same thing. And then you create a systematic way in which that word is used by that particular author that creates maybe another category or many times it's the same category because they were because it was a normative way in which the early church read those passages. Yeah. So this is, are y'all tracking with me this evening? I still got some energy. Amen. So the same, and so the same sense appears in chapter 26, verse 54, and chapter 56, 
where Jesus' suffering is seen as fulfilling the scriptures. And in 1314, where the compound form of the verb, anapurau, again, speaks of an Old Testament prophecy coming true in contemporary experience. In 314, to fulfill all righteousness, where Jesus gets baptized, appears to denote the action which will bring about God's redemptive purposes through Jesus Christ. It's banging. So when you look at all of these ideas in which we're talking about, about this word fulfill, it's very, very important. When someone says he came to do the law, that's not what it's saying there. All right, the famous Deuteronomy 28. So what they do, they state, read verse 68 again. Somebody grab that for me while I, while I read these. It says, they state that this verse proves that the so-called Negroes and the Hebrew, are the Hebrews of the Bible. Who else fulfills these prophecies, they'll ask you. Now, that's, not, that's, that's a horrible historical question. <laughs> who else fulfills them? Like, okay, have you studied history? Do you know how many people have experienced a lot of what's in Deuteronomy 28? Like, but if you're only familiar with your, in, with, with, with your own people or you only talk to people like you, that's called ghetto. <laughs> no, the real meaning of ghetto isn't hood. It means surrounded by the same thing and stuck in it. That means you have ghetto theology. That means, that means you got to know, you got to learn to study Chinese history. You got to stu study white history. You got to study other histories because when you see the repetition of history, it tells you what not to repeat. I should get a historical amen right there. But so they said, who fulfills these prophecies? And then they say, Egypt is, is America. Then we Hebrews never were taken back to geographical Egypt. Oh, this is fly. God was helping me with this earlier. Egypt under these circumstances. Now, they say this never happened in history. So they're counting on you not studying history. Mm. Now, the question is, the cur have the curses of Deuteronomy 28, they call it prophecy. Now, Deuteronomy, anybody know what that means without Googling it? Second law. So basically, it's a repeating of the law over again. Now, it does contain prophecies, but Deuteronomy 28 is not a prophecy. It is, the, it, it, it is curses based on the consequences of sin, the potential consequences. It's not saying this is going to happen. It's just saying, it's like, listen, your mama not prophesying if you say, if you do that again, I'm going to whip you and then you get whipped. That wasn't a prophecy. That was rules. That's what this is. This ain't a prophecy. Like, who fits the prophecy? This is not a prophecy. I wish they would stop saying that. Response. Deuteronomy isn't prophesying, but consequences of covenantal unfaithfulness. Woo! These things happen, and we'll see, in Jeremiah, Lamentations, Ezekiel, and Isaiah, Isaiah talks about it a bit. So look, look here. So now, let's, say one, let's give one historical response to this, right? One historical response. In 70 AD was the fall of Jerusalem as prophesied by Jesus in Matthew 24, okay? Now, the question is, what happened? Guess who says something about this? The non-Christian Jewish philosopher Josephus. Listen to what he says. Now, they're talking about coming back to Egypt and ships and all of this. Listen to what it says. It says, so this Froto slew all those that had been assiduous, uh, assiduous and robbers who were impeached one by another by the young men he chose out of the tallest and most beautiful and reserved them for the triumph. And as for the rest of the multitude that were above 17 years old, this is in the second century he's writing this, right? Well after that happened, right? But not, but not too far away from it. He put them into bonds, this is a historian, and sent them to the Egyptian mines. A Titus also sent a great number into the provinces, scattering of Israel. Um, it's talked about, and, and Ezekiel talked about that. As, as present to them that they might be destroyed upon their theaters by the sword and by wild beasts, by those who were under 17 years of age were sold for slavery. Everybody else wasn't. They were just put in the mines. Now watch this. Then in 120, uh, 135 A.D., Simon Bar Koba 
presents himself as the Messiah. So Jesus said this would happen in Matthew 24. Many will come in my name, but don't listen to him. So guess what happens? After the last overthrow of the Jews in Adrian, this is, this is written by uh, 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 um, Jerome the Great, one of the church fathers. It says, after the last overthrow of the Jews by Adrian, many thousands were sold and what could not be sold were transported into Egypt. So when did they, when did they go to Egypt? Well, how can they go to Egypt by ships, they say? Because you can't go to Egypt by ships. Why would you go from Egypt? Why would you go from Jerusalem to Egypt when you can walk from the interior, uh, from, from, from there to there? They, they brought them around the way in which you would never return. You, I said you would never go. They went by ships. How do we know? Because he says right here, and perished by shipwrecks or famine or slaughtered by people. I can keep going. But this is, this is just some examples of how in history much of this stuff had ha not fulfilled, but much of we see over and over and over again. This, and, what, and you know how gracious God is? Never in history does God bring all of the curses simultaneously on his people. Even when God cursed his people, they weren't as cursed as they could be. <laughs> they weren't as cursed as they could be. Even now, if you're even using that, it's still not as bad as it could be, even in your life. Response. Now, this is another response. So, if blacks are the original Hebrews, how long does sins last? Grab Deuteronomy chapter 5, verse 9 through 10 for me. How long does God's rebuke for sins last? That's the question. Go ahead and read it. Do not bow and worship to them and do not serve them because I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing the children for the father's iniquity to the third and fourth generations of those who hate me, but showing faithful love to a thousand generations of those who love me and keep my commands. Now, how many generations does God's hate last? I mean, that, that does God's uh, uh, discipline of his people last? No, 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 no. Read exactly. Read what he said. Go ahead. Uh, do not bow and worship to them. Do not serve them because I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing the children for the father's iniquity to the third and fourth generations of those who hate me. Stop. The third and fourth generation of those who what? Hate me. So what if a generation stops hating him? He restores that generation. So curses are not automatically continued to be imputed upon generations if there's repentance. <laughs> That's why there's no such thing as generational curses, because you can stop and repent and put an end to it right there. <laughs> so, so, so oh, hold on, let's do the math now. Are y'all still with me? Yeah. I know it's late. So, so it's been 1900, over 1,900 years since... 70 A.D. and 135 A.D. So if the sins that were committed back then are still on us, how in the world did it last? I thought it lasted to the third or fourth generation of those who hate him. So, if it, so how many generations? Don't even try to count. <laughs> so how many generations has it been? Now you're saying this continues. That's, that's, that's impossible, right? That's impossible. Now, grab for me. Um, this is good. Jesus, this is the other one. Jesus only came for the lost sheep of the tribe of Israel. This is a beautiful one right here. Grab for me, uh, Matthew, uh, uh, Glenn, grab Matthew 15, 21 through 24. Nico, grab Matthew 11, 21 through 22. Now, one of the things that they'll say and the dude, while he's holding the Bible, he has come only for the lost sheep of the tribe of Israel. Uh, who? Israel. Who? Israel. And they'll say that over and over and over again, right? And so, they, they, you know, and so you'll go over and over and over again and say that, right? But let's re read Matthew 15, verses 21 through 24. Read that. When Jesus left there, he withdrew to the area of Tyre and Sidon. Just then, a Canaanite woman from that region came and kept crying out, Have mercy on me, Lord, son of David. My daughter is severely tormented by a demon. Uh -huh. Jesus did not say a word to her. His disciples approached him and urged him, Send her away because she's crying out uh -huh. after us. 
He replied, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Right. So what Jesus is saying, J Jesus begins talking to the woman and lets her know that he was sent to the lost sheep of the tribe of Israel. When he's saying that, he's not saying that it's limited to Israel. But what does it say right there in the passage? Keep reading for me, if you don't mind. But she came, knelt before him, and said, Lord, help me. He answered, it isn't right to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. Mm. Yes, Lord, she said, yet even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. Then Jesus replied to her, woman, your faith is great. Let it be done for you as you want. And from that moment, her daughter was healed. Stop. Now, this is a Canaanite woman. The text said she's a Canaanite woman. She's not a scattered Israelite. She's a Canaanite woman. Now, what area of was this? Go back up to verse 21. What area was this? Read that again. When Jesus left there, he withdrew to the area of Tyre and Sidon. Stop right there. Tyre and Sidon, right? Now, read over when Jesus sends the woes to the Pharisees and the Sadducees oh, and the chief all of, over in Matthew 11, verses 21 through 22. Read that. Woe to you, Cherizen. Woe to you, Bethsaida. For if the miracles that were done in you had been done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented in sackcloth and ashes long ago. But I tell you, it would be more tolerable for Tyre and Sidon on the day of judgment than for you. Where was the Canaanite woman from? Right there. So in the 11th chapter, he said, if I had to preach this to Tyre and Sidon back in, the, back in Tanakh, back in the Old Testament, they would have repented. So Jesus perfectly gives them an object lesson and goes to the area of Tyre and Sidon to show them like that you didn't repent, but this one woman has greater faith than you, and she repents because she is from Tyre and Sidon. So guess what? Even though Jesus specifically came to fulfill the law and the prophets and engage the, the lost sheep of the tribes of Israel, one of the important things that we see in the passage is he made concession here to engage this woman which is mind-boggling for me right here. Also, I don't have time to go through it, but Job was an Edomite, not a Hebrew. The Septuagint talks about it. So I don't have time to dive into that. So he was an Edomite. So now let's go over to their understanding of the of Bible interpretation and study. So turn over to, um, turn, turn over to, actually I'm supposed to have ch chapter, uh, verse 11 there. Turn over to um, Isaiah 28, verse 11 and verse 13 mainly. Let's look at that. Let's look at that. And read it. Matter of fact, read it in the King James Version because I want to show you something. Read it in the King James Version. Grab that for me. Isaiah. Matter of fact, you grab it in the King James Version, Nico. You grab it in the CSB. And let's show something very, very clear that happens in the way the King James translators translated this passage and the difference between the way this is laid out here. Let's go to Isaiah 28 and read it. Now in the King James Version, read verse, just read verses 11. Matter of fact, read, read verses, how much did I want you to read? Read verses, matter of fact, read verses 10. No, read verses 9 to 13 in both translations. King James first, go ahead. Whom shall he teach knowledge? And whom shall he make to understand doctrine? Mm -hmm. Them that are weaned from the milk and drawn from the breast. For precept must be upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, here a little and there a little. For the stammering lips and another tongue will he speak to, his peop to this people, to whom he said, this is the rest wherewith ye may cause the weary to rest, and this is the refreshing, yet they would not hear. But the word of the Lord was unto them precept upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, here a little and there a little, that they might go and fall backward and be broken and snared and taken. Read, read, it, in, uh, read it in the CSB. <clears throat> Who is he trying to teach? Who is he trying to instruct? Infants just weaned from milk. <laughs> Babies removed from the breast. Law after law, law after law, line after line, line after line. A little here, a little there. For he will speak to this people with stammering speech mm -hmm. and in a foreign language. Mm -hmm. He has said to them, this is the place of rest. Let the weary rest. This is the place of repose. But they would not listen. 
The word of the Lord will come to them. Mm -hmm. Law after law, law after law, line after line, line after line, a little here, a little there. So they go stumbling backward to be broken, trapped, and captured. Now, <clears throat> this passage is used because they'll grab a verse here and a verse there saying a little there, 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 there a little. Now, when we look at this passage and you look at verse 10 in the King James Version, it says precept must be upon precept. Now, if you look at the King James Version, it does not have must be in the original because it's in italics letters of the King James translators trying to smooth out the translation. But the original does not have must be. So precept must not be upon precept because that's not in the original. When you read in the other translations, they, they show you clearly what's going on. Now the question is, what's going on in this passage that we need to understand? Must be is in italics, which lets you know that it's not in the original. Number two, this is a prophecy about the tribe of Ephraim, not Bible study methods. Look at verse one. Woe to the majestic crown of Ephraim's drunkards. So basically, he's rebuking them for their drunkenness. That's the context of this passage. Now, it is God using the methods of teaching Hebrew children. How do I know that? Look back at verse 9. It says, who is he uh, trying to teach? Who is he trying to instruct? Infants just weaned from milk. B babies are removed from the breast. And so basically, he said, this is children seeping. In other words, which is very simple, simple teaching, which is for children. Stay with me. However, God's people won't understand it. In other words, God is this is a rebuke. God says, I'm going to have them come to you with baby teaching. And you're so hard and of heart, I won't even give you the whole Bible. And the little bit that I gave you, you can't handle. How do I know? Look at verse 13. Verse 13 says, so they go what? Stumbling backward to be broken, trapped, and captured. So this has nothing to do with Bible study methods. It's a judgment on God's people for them not being faithful to the Lord because of their drunkenness, and they're getting a little here and there a little, and they can't even keep that. And God is basically saying, I'll just give you enough to be little. This is not normative Bible study. How do I know that? Because if here a little, there a little is what happened, then over in Nehemiah, they didn't do here a little, there a little, because Nehemiah is after Isaiah. It says in Nehemiah chapter, one, um, chapter 8, it says, when the seventh month came and the Israelites had settled in the towns, all the peoples gathered together at the square in front of the water gate. They asked the scribe Ezra to bring the book of the law of Moses that the Lord had given Israel on the first day of the seventh month. The priest uh, Ezra brought the law before the assembly of men, women, and all the who could listen with understanding while he was facing the square in front of the gate, he read out from it, uh, of, uh, out of it, from daybreak until noon before the men, the women, and those who could understand. All the people listened attentively to the book of the law. Did he go here a little, there a little? No. And we'll see how he broke up into groups and began explaining sections of scripture after the whole book was read. I want to give y'all this for free. Some, 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 some of us can't sit under 30 minutes of teaching. They listen to the book of the law all day and just it being read before it even, they even started teaching it. You go over 30 minutes for some of us, we yawning in, in, on Facebook. That's all right. Anyway. So, the, so again, uh, we, we, already, we already did that. We already did that. We already did that. We good. We good. We good. We already did that. We already did that. Yeah, we already did that. Yeah, we did that. Yeah, we did that. Okay, last one, and then we'll go to... What, what's a call? I'm going to move on through that so we can open it up for questions in the next few minutes. Y'all still with me? Yeah. So in Isaiah 14, go over to Isaiah 14. Read, um, guess you grab it, Isaiah 14 in uh, the King James. You got a King James? No. No. Read it in the King James, uh, 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 Mike, and then you grab it in the CSB. Right. Yep. Yeah. Isaiah 14... I want to do, let me see which verses I want to do out of Isaiah 14. I thought I'd put them up there. Isaiah 14, verses, yeah, 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 we're going to do that. We'll do verses 1, yeah, there we go. Verses 1 through 2. 
Go ahead and read that. For the Lord will have mercy on Jacob and will yet choose Israel and set them in their own land. And the strangers shall be joined with them and they shall cleave to the house of Jacob. And the people shall take them and bring them to their place. And the house of Israel shall possess them in the land of the Lord for servants and handmaids. And they shall take them captives whose captives they were and they shall rule over their oppressors. Huh. That's what they usually say. They're going to enslave white people. Go ahead. Read it. Read it in the CSB for me. Please. For the Lord will have compassion on Jacob and will choose Israel again. Yeah. He will settle them on their own land. The resident alien will join and be united with the house of Jacob. The nations will escort Israel and bring it to its homeland. Then the house of Israel will possess them as male and female slaves in the Lord's land. They will make captives of their captives and will rule over their oppressors. Mm, good stuff. Now, they say this is going to be fulfilled in the kingdom. When Jesus Christ comes back, Yahweh is going to come back and destroy everything, and they're going to be over their oppressors. The problem is, when you read the Bible, these things have already been fulfilled. Yep. Now, grab the Isaiah passages for me. Every one of the Isaiah passages up there you see, Isaiah 13, 1, 17 through 19, and Isaiah 13, 17 through 19. That's up there, right? Uh, I got that twice. And then you go ahead and get that Daniel passage, the Daniel 5, 25 through 30, and Ezra 21, and uh, 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 I mean 20, uh, 2, 1, 6, the four through 70. It's more passages that said this come to pass, but these are the ones where y'all see them out there and had the people licking their boots and stuff, talking about you'll lick the dust off my boot. Yeah, they have people with white folk bow before them and, 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 and lick the boots. It's crazy, um, which we found out they pay people for that. They pay pipe heads. Anyway. Wow. wow. That's what we found out. So. Wow. <laughs> All right. First one, Isaiah, the Isaiah passages. Remember, this is passage on slavery after captivity. Go ahead. A pronouncement concerning Babylon that Isaiah, son of Amoz, saw. Now go down to verse uh, 17. 17, yeah. So it's, we just read that to let you know that he's talking about Babylon. Go to, go to verse 17. Uh, yep, 17 through 19. Look, I'm stirring up the Medes against them who cannot be bought off with silver and who have no desire for gold. Their bows will cut young men to pieces. They will have no compassion on offspring. They will not look with pity on children. And Babylon, the jewel of the kingdoms, the glory of the pride of the Chaldeans, will be like Sodom and mm -hmm. Gomorrah mm -hmm. when God overthrew them. Mm -hmm. Now, no, go ahead. go ahead. I'm sorry. Is that it? Yeah. Verse 19, yep. Now, now, now grab the Daniel passage and then go back to the Ezra passage. The Daniel passage. The Daniel... Uh, the Daniel 5, 25 through 30. Read that. And this is the writing that was written. Mene, Mene, Pekel, Upharsin. Uh, 5, and then Ezra 2, 1. Now these are the children of the province that went up out of captivity of those which had been carried away, whom Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, had carried away unto Babylon and came again unto Jerusalem and Judah Everyone unto his city. Yeah. Uh, 64. The whole congregation together was 42 and 2,303 score. Uh huh. Beside their servants and their maids, of whom there were 7,337. Yep. And there were among them 200 singing men and singing women. Their horses were 730 and six, their mules 240 and five. Their camels, 430 and 5. Their donkeys, 6,720. And some of the chief of the fathers, when they came to the house of the Lord, which is at Jerusalem, offered freely for the house of God to set it up in his place. They gave after their ability unto the treasure of the work threescore and 100,000 100, drams of gold, 5,000 pounds of silver, and 100 priest garments. That's good. That's good. So you see up in verse 65, it says, not including their 7,337 uh, 7, male and female servants or slaves. So you see right there that this came to pass because what? Ezra is after Isaiah. 
So now you see that that already came to pass. And then you see the Babylonian issue coming to pass up in chapter 5, which was prophesied up in Isaiah 14, actually came to pass in Daniel chapter 5, verses 20, uh, 25 through uh, uh, 30, where the, the Persians and the Medes came in, and it talks about all of that and what will happen. Again, uh, these are just some ways in which uh, you'll see that. So how to spot a cult? And I'm done. Ten warning signs a potentially unsafe group or leader. This is the leader part first. Absolute authoritarian without meaningful accountability. No tolerance for questions or critical inquiry. No meaningful financial disclosure regard, regarding budget expenses such as an independently audited financial statement. Unreasonable fear about outside world such as impending catastrophe, evil conspiracies, and persecutions. There is no legitimate reason to leave. Former followers are always wrong in leaving negative or even evil. What are some potential signs of unsafe group of leader? How you know it's unsafe? Warning signs. Former members often relate the same stories of abuse and reflect a similar pattern of grievances, like on YouTube. You see a lot of that with Pastor Dow and all of these different groups. There are record, records, books, news articles, and television programs that document the abuses of the group or leader. Followers feel they can never be good enough. The group or leader is always right. The group leader is the exclusive mean. We got some churches like this. Somebody y'all having flashbacks. <laughs> but these groups are definitely like that. And the group leader is the exclusive means of knowing truth. IUIC is a group I have there. They offered to talk to me, and then they didn't hear me back. But we got, um, I got their whole precept package, all of their little lessons, things that they use to, 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 to kind of combat uh, different things that Christians believe and try to promote their belief, and they have to memorize it. Of the group of leaders, it means of knowing the truth. And you, they can't teach anything out of their, outside of their breakdown, so they'll be uh, challenged about it. Or receiving validation. No, no other process of discovery is really acceptable or credible. Lastly, 10 warning signs. Uh, 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 I think this is part of the other one. That people involved in with a potentially unsafe group of leader. And this is stuff you need for your friends and that type of thing as well, who may be involved in stuff like this. Um, extreme obsessiveness regarding the group or leader resulting in exclusive uh, 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 um, uh, of almost every uh, practical consideration. Now, some of these, you got to understand with Hebrew Israelites, uh, there's a lot of individual Hebrew Israelites that aren't part of camps and aren't a part of groups, but you'll see some of the cultic signs in the way they believe it. The exclusivism in the way in which they function in it is still cultic in philosophy. Individual uh, identity, the group, the leader, or... God as distinct and separate categories of existence becoming increasingly blurred. Instead, in other words, the leader almost seems like God. Instead, and I can't tell you that a lot of these groups will call themselves gods. Like, uh, I, like IUIC, like IUS, I, I, ICUPK, I should have put the video up there, and the group, uh, all of them, all of the camps do. Instead, in the followers' mind, these identities become substantially increasingly uh, fused as that person's involvement with the group leader continues and deepens. So when you look at the beginning of the, when I showed those videos in the beginning and those pastors handing their keys to their churches over to the leader of the ISUPK, that was a sign uh, that, like they, they really big up General Yohanna in particular as kind of like he's, you know, the ISUPK is the center of truth and all that type of thing. Uh, uh, and, but you gotta be under command of General Yohanna in order to get this truth. If I ever get up in here and say, unless you're under Dr. Eric Mason and his philosophy and teachings, you're not following the truth. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except by me. If I start acting crazy, y'all rebuke me, put me under discipline. If I won't stop, leave. Amen. Or get rid of me. Because this church doesn't belong to me, it belongs to the Lord. Amen. Whenever the group leader is criticized or questioned, it is characterized as persecution. See, you're, you're persecuting us just like the so-called white man. See, y'all, you, you always, see, you're just a dead-minded Negro, and see, you're a Jake. But it, that's, a whole, that's all of their little language that they use, right? A, a, a Hebrew that doesn't know they're Hebrew, so they call you a Jake. Uncharacteristically stilted and seemingly programmed com, uh, conversation and mannerisms. They, you'll hear them always say, man, 
man, at the end, like if you listen to them, all of their mannerisms are the same. Like I let them read the Bible how they wanted to. But if you notice, all of them have to hold the Bible. They have to stand like that. Isaiah, the 14th chapter. Everybody sound the same. Cloning of the group, leader, and personal behavior. We'll talk about all of these. You can take a picture of it, but dependency upon the group. Hyperactivity centered on the group agenda, which seems to supersede any personal goals. Or in the, so you, 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 you can't have a life. <laughs> you can't have a life. A dramatic loss of spontaneity. You can't do nothing with your life. Sense of humor. You got to say what's funny, what's there, they believe is funny. Increasing isolation from family and old friends. Uh-oh. Unless they demonstrate an interest in the group. That's a clear sign of it. Matter of fact, the group in, uh, it's a group in Dallas that they, they, they got drawn out and uh, 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 a pastor's son got drawn into Hebrew Israelism and they took half the ch over half the church with them. And, 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 the father, and the father literally, the son hasn't even talked to the father himself for like once uh, because the group, want, you can't be around them because you're not a part of the group. Former followers are, are, are best considered negative or worse evil and under bad influences. Again, lastly, a safe, uh, 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 so what does a safe group look like? Now we know what the devil look like. Let's, let's look at what a safe group, a safe group leader or leader will answer your questions without becoming judgmental mental or punitive. A safe group leader will disclose information such as finances. I think we just did one of those the other day. Yeah. And offer an independently audited financial statement. We wouldn't be able to even buy this building or get the loan that we got now if we didn't have audited statements regarding budget and expenses. Safe groups and leaders will tell you more than you want to know. Uh, that's why some of y'all don't come to the financial meeting. <laughs> A safe group or leader is often democratic, sharing decision making and encouraging accountability and oversight. That's why we have elders here. Not not just merely a senior pastor. We have a senior pastor, but we have elders, a community of, uh, uh, of accountability. Even our deacons hold, uh, have a level of accountability with as well. A safe group or leader may have disgruntled former followers, which we probably have and have had in the past, but will not vilify them, basically, and excommunicate or forbid others from associating with them. Like Y'all have heard us when we told people we're not associating with a certain group, but we say we, you could talk to them, but, like, you know, um, um, you know, that, that, that's like, I think that's very important. A safe group of leader will not have a proper, uh, 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 will not have a paper trail of overwhelmingly negative records, books, articles, statements about them, uh, so forth and so on. So these are just some things that I think that are helpful for us to be able to spot uh, some things. A safe group of leader will encourage critical thinking. <laughs> critical thinking. Not, in, in other words, good leadership teaches you how to think, not just what to think. Right? Okay, and that's, that's very, can, can, can accept constructive criticism. Um, Dr. Sarita led the thing last night with the town hall and all of that. You know, that scares me to death all the time when I hear what y'all think, but I got to deal with it. I don't know what y'all be thinking. So I will hear something negative, you know. You'd be like, what, what's this going to be? So I guess what I got to do, I got to man up and ingest it and figure out how we can lead change in the church. You can see a lot of this is insecurity. Cults are based on insecurity. <laughs> um, but then these are some resources YouTube channel one of the guys a couple of guys that helped me work through some of their breakdowns was faithful to God vocab alone they, I got some resources up here theirs um, Jesus uh, uh, Jesus Christ the way uh, they have a couple of debates on it that's just amazing um, that they did with some Hebrew Israelites and, they, and it, it was a very amicable debate even though the Hebrew Israelites were a camp they weren't jerks they weren't cursing they were, they were amicable to an extent and the, uh, the, the Latino brothers who were engaging them were very gracious yet strong, and it was a good, it was a good but the Hebrew Israelites lost terribly um, because of the content of their information. Uh, Jesus is the word. He's dope. He goes out on the streets and engages them. Sister Nefernetti, she's dope. She's a lawyer, so she brings her lawyer into the into the uh, into her uh, rhetorical argumentation. Apart. She's like brilliant. She just did this one on Serapis. The thing was nuts. Um, she's dope. Urban Perspective by Pastor Jerome Gay, Urban Logia by Damon Richardson. 
um, thriving. We have a master class that's coming up. I told you all about that. We have a new Woke Church uh, video series that's coming up, uh, past conference workshops. I'm telling you, go back to those old workshops from the conferences and grab them joints and download, buy, buy those, download those. You know, go to the app and consider we'll talk about monthly connection to help us to get more creative because videos cost. These some books, um, 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 vocabs book. I love from every nation and people because it's a biblical theology of race throughout the Bible. And so one of the things is it's not just you learning Hebrew Israelism. One of the things that you got to be able to do also as a believer is you got to be able to build your biblical theology of race from the scriptures. Um, that's the way to get in front of it. Um, the, these are, are for everybody. But the reason why we this is a dignity building books. These are back from the early 90s. These are some OG books. Um, Blacks in the Bible, dope books that really walk through that the Sh who the Shemites actually are, who the Japhethites are. These are very, very, very good books on black presence in the Bible. And it's not to paint the Bible black and say everybody in the Bible was black, but it's talking about the black presence that's in there. If you can get anything by J. Daniel Hayes, uh, get it. I didn't put that up here, but J. Daniel Hayes, has some, he's a white guy that talks about the way in which academia has written blacks out of the Bible. And so he helps us to return to the, some of that and help and do that. Defending black faith, this is not specifically on Hebrew Israelite issues, but it's on classic uh, uh, it's on classic stuff about dignity defense. Roundtable is dope as well. They got some good stuff on there where they're just doing some interviews in that book about people who were actually in these and how they were talking to them and lovingly engaging them. These are just some resources. There's more out there, but these are a good way to start. Um, I got some other ones up here. If you want to work on your hermeneutics, this is an excellent book on developing your biblical hermeneutics. It's called Hermeneutics, Principles and Process of Biblical Interpretation. This is, this is big boy, big girl stuff. Okay, so this is when you, you start to learn how to interpret the scripture. Now, this is the monstrosity. But this is hermeneutical spiral. This is a monstrosity, a tour de force, if you will. Um, y'all come up here and look at this. Don't steal my stuff after the thing. Um, <laughs> I'm just letting y'all know. I've seen some of y'all eyeballing and looking you know, like you possess with something. But um, make sure you don't take possession of my book. This is that book I quoted from earlier. Um, this is a, a this is an alternative Bible they use called the Sefer, which was not done by blacks. This is a big, uh, I know I'm going all over the place. Now, turn, you can turn the lights up, because I'm going to get ready to open it up for questions. We'll lead the rest of our time for questions. Are y'all okay to stay for some questions? Yeah. All right. Um, this is a, a documentary that they have. This guy reached out to me, Hebrews to Negroes. And um, he reached out to me because, you know, all of them has been funny. Um, you know, it's funny. They've been talking about us for a long time. When we start talking back, they're acting like we're not being right. In the sense of, y'all not being, like, why y'all coming at us? Why don't y'all come up to the so-called white man or whatever? And so I told this guy, because he was talking a little bit of trash, and I'm saying this on video. I'm getting a group of us to go through this, comb through this pseudo-history. And we're going to pick it apart piece by piece and do, and y'all got to pray, y'all got to pray because I want to do an, a, a, a documentary, a three to five documentary series on black dignity. Wow. Um, that I, 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 the more and more I do this, I want to do a full like documentary on not just this stuff, but just on black, black dignity and, and religion. Um, very, very important. So those are just some of the things. This is where they try to get their pseudo history from. Uh, this is one of their main books by Rudolph Windsor. He's from here. It's a lot of stuff up here. Let me um let me go ahead. Y'all hit those lights up. Let's go ahead and put the mics right here now. Um, was any of this helpful for y'all tonight? All right. It's a lot more of this stuff we could have gone through, but we'll do some other stuff um, another time. Uh, questions? Anyone questions? I want to see folks. So yeah, questions. Yeah, right here. We we got um, Izzy has a question. Is it a microphone over here? Okay. Yep. Um, so my, one of my questions is, um, well, first of all, thank you so much for the presentation and taking all the time to do this research. I think it's so important. And um, I think for me, it was striking seeing how this response can come out of um, just trauma. It's like a response to like historical trauma. Absolutely. And so the first part of my question is how have you seen women been su being successful in engaging other women? Gotcha. Because I haven't seen any women in this movement or um, 
Yeah. So how can women yeah. be engaging? And then also, yeah. Um, do his Hebrew, Hebrew Israelites believe in the Great Commission as outlined in Matthew twenty eight that the gospel is supposed to be preached to all people? And if when they're brought like that text, how do they deal with that? Yeah. So the first question. How to, involve, uh, how to engage women. One of the groups up here, um, back um, up, uh, ISUPK, you will rarely ever see a woman in their, I've, I've literally never really seen a woman in their movement. In, 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 not in their movement. Yeah, in their, in their particular piece of the movement. So them right there, those guys right there, I've never seen the women. Uh, you, can, you, can, you can probably, you can Google them and put in, I mean, not Google, put them in on Instagram, and you'll see some women, but it's rare that they show women. This group shows women all the time, IUIC. Um, and to be honest, um, I've only talked to a few women who have engaged women within the movement. Now, the ones where you'll see women more engaged, uh, way more, they engage women hard, is these two right here. Because she's a stronger teacher than him. And so um, he plays too much and always ragging on the church. And he sounds like an old church preacher. And, and, um, but she knows a, 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 enough, to be, enough Hebrew to be dangerous. And so she goes around and it's, it's scores of women, thousands of women that really follow her and follow them because they present a more cleaner brand of Hebrew Israelism. So engaging, I think, one of the ways it's important for women to engage women, I think first off is um, understanding the scriptures. And one of the things is you have actually a better opportunity of engaging the women than a man does, which usually is a stronger back door to engaging the household. And so, um, and, so, and so one of the things I would just suggest is just the normal stuff you would do to talk to them about opening up about salvation. So what is salvation? Ask them about that. So how does your ethnicity connect to salvation or is it? Is it because because is according to what Hebrew Israelite group you're talking to, they have different beliefs, which leads to your second question. When you ask the second question about um, the Great Commission, which helps with the first question, um, when you ask about the Great Commission and going into all nations, they would say that going into all nations, ethnos there, uh, uh, Old Testament is goyim, New Testament is ethnos, and um, and one of the things that you'll see is they'll say. Going into all nations is going because the, the, the northern tribes through uh, the Assyrian captivity was scattered and basically into all the nations. So what they would say is we're supposed to go to the like Jesus to the lost sheep of the tribes of Israel who are Israelites all over the globe who we're supposed to engage to regather those particular groups. So we're not going to those nations. We're going to those people who are Israelites who don't know that they're Israelites in those nations. So that's their answer there. And then you begin to say, no, the word for nations means nations. That's when you got to do your word study stuff. You know, and that's when you begin to say, no, let's look at Goyim. Let's look at Ethnos. And let's look at how the semantic domain is used. And they'll say, there's one semantic domain where Israelites are called Gentiles. One. And that's all, but it's never really used in the Bible ever, right? Um, unless it's calling Israel a nation, right? Not the nations. Israel is never called the nations in the Old Testament ever. So, yeah, it's, it's very, very important. Yeah, it tells them not to be like the nations, which is very, very important. Yeah. Yes. Hi. Um, I just have one question. Maybe yes. you probably already answered yeah. it in the last one. Um, when you say that they evangelize mainly to African Americans, what do you, what do they think about Africans in general? Like, yeah. are they classed as somebody whom you? Can I wish I had time to pull up a video, because um, like old. One Westers, like again, this group is different. They're going to be a lot more. Um, they're going to be a lot more modern. Now these groups, right here, um, particularly, that I'm going past it. This group right here, they have a video of. I must have went past. Yeah, they have a video of an African standing out there, and they say they, like, are bitter with Africans saying you sold us to the white man. And it's basically, particularly Nigerians and Sierra, people from Sierra Leone, Ivory Coast, all those, and literally just cussing them out. Like I'm talking about, when I, I'm, talking about I'm talking about old school back alley gully cussing out. I mean, it, 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 it may literally hate Africans, 
But what they will say is there are tribes of Israel that are in Africa. So the Nigerians that they like are the Yoruba because they believe the Igbo and the Yoruba, they're, they're, they, they have Hebrew roots because they believe etymologically the word Yoruba and Igbo, Igbo, which they would say, they would say Igbo, and, and, and which that's not a word, but, um, you know, uh, which, which is a form of them basically slandering us, kind of saying, those who are not Jewish say Igbo is really a slang term for Hebrew, which if you study the word Igbo and Hebrew, they're two totally different words. Yes. And the question is, how old is the word Igbo? See, just doing basic stuff. How old is the word Igbo, and what's the etymology, etymology of the word? But they're saying, nah, these are slang terms from Hebrew. So, again, I'm saying that to say they don't like Africans that are really African because, quote, unquote, they sold us into slavery. Great question. Yes. And I'm talking about the camps, not everybody. Again, I don't want to lump everybody in. Yes. Um, do you think it would be a conducive angle to show them in scripture that their identity and freedom is more in Christ than in their identity since they like to talk about law so much so um, and try to overtalk you with the their weird scriptures or whatever? So is it like if we get back to that, that their identity is more than in Christ than in their ethnicity? Well, they would say, well, Jesus' identity, if it's in Christ, he's a Hebrew. That's exactly where they would go. Because he had to be made like his brothers in all respects, Hebrews says. And because of that, then they would go and talk about you can't separate spiritual identity from natural identity because the Israel is the only ones that's supposed to be saved. He's given his statutes unto Jacob. Then they go, he came for the lost sheep of the tribe of Israel only. And so, therefore, you can't separate my spiritual identity because they said it's not a religion, it's a culture. So that's where they're going to go on you. The key to what you're saying, though, is not... Like, like some of us, I'll go out on a line and I'll talk to them. I don't care, right? But I think the more effective way long term is small personal interactions with small groups behind closed doors. I, I think sometime on the line is to kind of shut some stuff down, which I think it's it's a lot of like a guy named G-Man, another dude named So So Real, and dude, Jesus is the word. Um, other guys, they go out and they actually engage them on the line. They made one group leave. But then for, to answer back at your question, Izzy, one of the things that's very important is personal interaction. That Colossians chapter 4, verses 2 through 6. Acting with, uh, praying for the open door for the word. Acting with wisdom towards outsiders. And beginning to slowly, instead of looking at it as a one-shot baseball bat slam, it's a progressive engagement of uh, 1 Corinthians 3, 6. One plants, one waters, God adds the growth. One, so sometimes it'll be plant, 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 water, 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 water. Plant, 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 water, water, water. Five years later, you were right. God adds the growth. Because God adding the growth is God's sovereign, supernatural saving work of turning those germinating seeds and watering into actually a salvific experience. Yeah, yeah, yes. Um, so in your experience, have you found um, the evidential apologetic method to be like beneficial when speaking with them because sometimes it seems like they're not, they're not actually listening to you when you're talking they're just kind of talking over you so you can be giving them really good evidences but yeah. it's like they're not listening they're kind of presupposing that the evidences aren't good enough yeah the, the key is with them is scripture scripture when you begin to get into history and presuppositional apologetics and you start using apologetics methods, you have to do it in a way where they don't know it. Because usually what you have to do is you have to pit the, because they believe in that Isaiah 28 passage, what they're going to do is they're going to hit you with a bunch of scriptures, bunch of scriptures. And you'll begin to say history, where's that in the Bible? I don't see that in the scripture. And then you got to be like, no, let's go. First off, let's start with, let's stop at that one passage and let's read what this passage is about. They're not used to that. Then saying, okay, there's a passage that affirms this passage because Scripture does interpret Scripture. Let's go over it and then slowly but surely doing it that way. You, uh, only ones that will maybe, the camps is just you just can't do any of the normal apologetics methods that you would normally do, that you would learn from a Ravi Zachariah or in, uh, Na Naeem who's dead um, and, uh, and gone home to be with the Lord rather and um, the other guy that's online. They have really good apologetics methods, but it's very difficult to do it with them unless you get the ones that believe in history because they use history with you only when it's convenient they only use it if it's convenient to their point but when you try to use history they try to get you back off track because that's really not their strong suit absolutely great question yes 
Um, while it's unfortunate um, that many of the churches don't, the community of churches, with especially here in Philadelphia or the tri-state area, down in Virginia as well, um, Maryland, they're not as knowledgeable, the leadership. Yeah. in regards to what it is that you teach, in regards to how to the defend the faith. Um, they come from, even here locally, um, it's more so witnessing going to the corner with a bullhorn, but when someone comes up, it's rebuking them or speaking in tongues, something, you know, to kind of turn them away instead right. of engaging them. So um, how open are you to, for some of the churches that some of us may be connected with um, and their members are reaching out and they're asking questions because they see different things and they realize something's going on but they're not really sure. Right. How open are you to maybe open going to some of these churches if the pastors would allow it to begin teaching? I mean, I know you have the stuff yeah, you yeah, teach yeah. here, but yeah. these churches, um, many of them I can speak for or at least to where I know there's a large congregation but we don't know um, as a whole how to defend the faith and what they don't there is many churches they're not even aware of what's going on with the Hebrew words like community mm -hmm. they're not aware of what's going on with the conscious community and the fact that many of our youth have now left the church yeah. to follow these things so yeah. and they don't want to hear it from us yeah. because we can't really speak it the way that you speak it yeah. so yeah, I think, I mean, that's why we opened up the Frequency Conference, because we, we'll have some more experts coming this year. I'd be open to it. That's why we opened this up to everybody to come. So I think there are opportunities to come. I just, most of the times, churches don't deal with this type of stuff until it hits their church in a way that hurts the church. Um, there's a church in Texas. I won't say what the name of it is. Well-known preacher. He has about 25,000 people. He's had droves of, the Hebrew Israelites literally set up shop right on the outside of the outskirts of his church as people are coming in and walking past and engage them. They've had multiple waves of people leave that church and they haven't really even set anything up. I mean, they're not, they're not feeling it because they got so many people, but, but it's hurt him. And now they're trying to figure out what do they need to do to, uh, to, 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 to basically rebut those attacks, which I think is very, very important to do. But I think church, I think pastors have to take the initiative to see one of their roles as, you know, I know you want to get, you want to put your foot on the podium and hold the, hold the handkerchief back, and you want to talk about didn't he die, didn't he die, didn't they put him in the grave, and didn't they get him up, and that's all fine, you know, and somebody hitting you on the back, and that's it. And, um, you know, and, and, and I think we need to preach the death, burial, and the resurrection, all, 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 all it's of what's important, but I, I, I think we've, I think we're just, we're doing, we're doing church, not being the church. And, and, and one of the things that I think that's important is it's hard to help people that don't see their need for help. And so for me as a pastor, my desire is that I, I don't, we haven't really been affected by it as a church. Because somebody was like, why are we talking about this all the time? Because as a pastor, if I see something as a shepherd, I can't wait till the wolf gets in the flock. When I, when I, see, when I see the wolf out coming towards y'all, I got to say, you know what? I got to train the sheep that a wolf is coming this way. That's how you do pastoring. You don't wait until crisis. You do prevention. And so you, 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 that's, that's what you have to do in pastoring. So, yeah, 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 yes. It, it seems like they also take advantage of just a, a lot of Christians not understanding the Old Testament and how to interpret the Old Testament. As a pastor, what are some things that just from pastor, but then also down to even lay leaders can do to better equip Christians to understand the Old Testament? Um, run in my office and look on the top shelf in the middle and get that book I think I showed you. <laughs> it's called um, Interpreting the New Testament in Light of the Old. It's a big black book where all my middle reference materials are. Yeah. It's by the blue chair. Just turn. It's in the middle <laughs> at the top. And... Um, um, it, it's so one of the things that I think Christians need to do is as you study the New Testament, know that the New Testament was not written in a vacuum. <laughs> Everything in the New Testament is foundationally based on something in the Old Testament. Like until Christians really understand that, a lot of times Christians don't recognize that everything that we understand is based in, on, on something in the Old Testament. When you look at Hebrews pointing back, when you look at um, even the idea of 1 John, when he talks about the law of Christ, when you look at, in the gospel, all of it is grabbing on some principle. And, and, and a lot of it also is grabbing on what, what Christ said as well in the gospels. That's why Paul would say, not, I'm not saying this, but the Lord is saying this. He's not saying he's not speaking anymore. 
He's saying, now I'm talking, I'm saying something that the Lord didn't say. Why? Because Jesus didn't talk about marriage a whole bunch. So in 1 Corinthians 7, he says, I say this, not the Lord. In other words, he's not saying I'm speaking on my own intention. He's saying these are some things about the law, I mean, about a marriage that Jesus didn't talk on, but I'm going to expound upon it. And so, and so again, you can hear, if you, if you read the Gospels and you read 1 Peter and 2 Peter, you can hear Jesus' teachings all through what Peter says. So, yeah, yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. Any other questions? Any other questions? Yes, right here. Uh, so I ran into um, uh, a good high school friend of mine, and mm -hmm. he's now a uh, Hebrew Israelite. Yeah. Uh, and uh, he, you know, you know how they go in and try to tell you that you brainwash <laughs> and everything yeah. like that. So um, I ran into a lot of arguments of whether or not Jesus was born by a virgin. Yeah. And rather the prophecies referred to him being born was by a virgin or just a marriable woman at the of the age. Yep. Um, personally, I fail to believe that Jesus was born illegitimately, for one. And then secondly, you know, I try to use scripture like... Uh, I'll say that last part again. No, I, yeah, I, I, I refuse to believe that Jesus was, was born, born illegitimately. illegitimately. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, and uh, I use like Isaiah and stuff like that, the books of Isaiah, like 7, 14 and things. Yeah. Nothing. Yeah, <laughs> and you know what? Like he tells me that I had the wrong interpretation of that scripture. Yeah. So no matter how far I deep, I mean, deep great deep, question. Yeah. Yeah, that's a very very good question. So we, uh, this was, I mean, I, I I've heard I only hear this every now and then. So one of the ways, and this is why Bible interpretation and understanding it is very very important. So when you study, pro this is very important. So when you study Old Testament prophecy. There are certain prophecies that are very Jesus specific. But then there are prophecies that are near prophecies and far prophecies. So when you look at Psalm 22, or when you look at even Psalm 2, where it talks about the Messianic king, it's literally talking about a king of that day. Like when you go over to Isaiah 14, and we go over to uh, Ezekiel 28, and you look at, it's talking about the it's talking about the king of Babylon in one passage, and it talks about another king, but it actually begins to talk about Shatan or the adversary, right? When you look at Isaiah uh, 714, it's actually talking about Ahaz, Ahaz, I believe it is in the passage, an actual king of that day, which it was fulfilled in that particular day. But then it goes forward and is more fully fulfilled in Jesus Christ. So the word there can be translated either way. They use the way that it was in its first prophecy, uh, and quoted the same way. I mean, quoted the same way only in the way that it was used by Isaiah in that particular passage. But then the question is, is he a Tanakh-only Hebrew Israelite? Because if, if, you, if you're not a Tanakh-only, which means you're Old Testament-only, Genesis to Malachi, um, New Testament, uh, and, you're not, and you're, you're not New Testament Israel, and you don't believe in the New Testament, then I understand why he would have that philosophy. But if he says he believes in the New Testament and it says that it was of a virgin, then you, how do you, the, the question is, how do you work through both of those issues being that particular text? Now, I'll give you another example. There's so many examples of it. Peter quotes Joel chapter 2 of, in latter days, it says, he will pour forth his spirit on all flesh. But then it wasn't even fully fulfilled in uh, Acts chapter 2 is supposed to be fulfilled again in the last days. So there, so when you study how the how Bible prophecy works, there are prophecies that are for that day that are more fully fulfilled in Jesus Christ because those things are shadow based on Hebrews. So um, a good book, a very, very good book on that is um, a book by uh, Gradanus. It's called The Modern Preacher and the Ancient Text, one of the best books I read in seminary. And it breaks down every genre of scripture. As a matter of fact, don't even grab that, but just that book, uh, the, the Modern Preacher and the Ancient Text, also grab his book, Preaching Christ from the Old Testament. Because he will give you different levels of typology that are in the Bible. He has, he'll talk about uh, 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 comparison contrast. He'll talk about um, a typology. He'll talk about redemptive historical, longitudinal themes, all those different things that are helpful for Bible interpretation. And so because Hebrew Israelites focus in on Isaiah 28, um, they miss out on the full breadth of how beautiful the scriptures is because you can't ignore a genre and just say a word and read a couple of things and then say, this is what it's saying. So that's very, very important. I got time for one more question, then we're done. Yep. 
Uh, we talked earlier about King James, and um, uh, I know that there were several different versions of the King James uh, Bible. Which do the Israelites hold to, uh, 16, yeah. 17, and finally, uh, <laughs> how does the Apocrypha uh, play into this? Wh yeah. Why do we not include it in the canon? Short version on, great, on that. Great question. So let me tackle the first question. The 1611 translation, if you read it, the Vs are used because the English language hasn't hadn't even transitioned. The, the, um, and the letter J wasn't in the original King James Version the way we use it. It's not, I mean, it was there, but it wasn't pronounced the way we, we pronounce it now. It was pronounced as an I. But when the English language transitioned, J and I was interchangeable even back then, and now it's progressed. So what's very, very important is none of them use a, a 1611. Like, when y'all get a chance, Go online and Google 1611 King James, King James. You won't even know what's going on because the language is, you're like, what is he saying? Because it's a language that we don't even use. So that's really a cut for them because they're actually using the one that was, the one that was updated in the 1800s. So if you're saying that even King James only people who utilize King James only stuff and you tell them, yo, like, if you King James only, why you don't use the, King, the 1611 translation if that's the only inspired translation when the book has been updated, like, several times since then? So I think that's very, very important. What was your last thing you asked, Seth? Apocrypha. Oh, the Apocrypha. Well, it, I mean, the Apocrypha, the Jews didn't even view the Apocrypha as insp inspired. So when you look at, I mean, that's just a real, that's an easy one. The Jews, the Jews didn't even believe. Let me see that bottom one. The Jews didn't even believe that um, that the Jews didn't even believe that the, uh, they thought it was good history. Tobias, uh, uh, um, uh, um, uh, Solomon, uh, some of the now this this one crazy because this one has the apocrypha in it, but it also has um, pseudo mystical uh, uh, Kabbalah books in it, like the like the like the Book of Jasper and all of that. And so it got some real, Book of Jasper is kind of weird. Um, it's really spooky. But no, uh, uh, some of the church fathers, if I'm gonna be honest, some of the church fathers thought that the Apocrypha should have been included in the canon, but it was not ultimately included in the canon. But you'll see even in the King James Version where it has the Apocrypha, King James didn't view it. Even if you read the original King James Version, they didn't believe that the Apocrypha was inspired. They just believed that it was good history. And we use, matter of fact, Jude and Second Peter, or Peter and Second Peter quotes from the book of Enoch. So they, they are books that are helpful, but they are good. They're books that aren't inspired. A good book to kind of help you on canonicity is a book by Norman Geisler called uh, Introduction to the Bible. Very, very good book to just give you some basic stuff on bibliology. All right, y'all. I'm done. Um, I'm going to just pray, um, and we can transition. Thank you all for coming. Hope this was helpful for you. Father. Thank you for this time. Thank you for the ultimate opportunity to be in the word, to teach the word, to communicate it, and to uh, be protective to your people in a loving way that helps shape and transform us to be helpful in being uh, rooted in our own faith, but also be engaging and loving to others. Lord, help us to love. Help us to be in love. Help us to be stern, but help us to love those who disagree. And the hopeful desire and the passionate desire is to see those who don't know you as Savior and who don't make Jesus Christ's death and resurrection the primary thing. Help us to be those who are able to show the clear importance of what it means to put our confidence in Christ and Christ alone. In Jesus' name we pray. Everybody agree with that said? Amen. God bless you. Take care.